Pickers. The House Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming looks into the future of oil production and alternative sources of energy. This is an hour and a half. This hearing is a uh, call to order, and we welcome everyone to the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming for this uh, very important and timely uh, hearing uh, dealing with the uh, energy uh, crisis that is uh, affecting our country. And, uh, and that raises a question. And the question is, when does a daily surprise of higher oil prices become a third energy crisis? That is the question we are reviewing at today's hearing. I think it is obvious to all Americans, at least those outside the presidential bubble, that America faces a huge energy problem and it is not going away soon. Since President Bush took office, oil has embarked on one of the greatest price run-ups in history. This energy spike is different. It was not brought on by an oil embargo, nor by a surprise revolution in the Middle East. That was what we saw in the 1970s. This time, it is different. This long, painful run-up is the direct result of an oil president and a Republican Congress executing an oil-centered energy policy. Today we will hear that without fundamental changes, oil demand will rise 30 percent worldwide over the next two decades. Where will all that additional supply come from? Our Republican friends say, go drill in pristine areas like the Arctic Refuge and in deep waters off the outer continental shelf? It sounds like a simple answer, but like so many other simple answers, it's misleading and it is wrong. The United States sits on less than 2 percent of the world's oil reserves, and we consume one quarter, 25 percent of the world's oil. Our own oil supply, without foreign imports, would last just three years. We simply cannot drill our way out of this crisis because we don't have the reserves. Who does have the oil to meet this rising demand? The answer is easy. As always, follow the money. Follow the tanker ships of American dollars that we've been shipping month after month to the Middle East. According to the International Energy Agency, OPEC countries would need to ratchet up production by 57 percent over the next two decades to meet projected demands. Does our President have a problem with this scenario? His visit to Saudi Arabia last month indicates not. In exchange for nothing more than a gentleman's agreement that Saudi, Saudi spigot, spigots will stay open, the President agreed to provide assistance to Saudi Arabia in developing their nuclear power capacity. While American consumers give Saudi Arabia $135 for each barrel of oil, President Bush is giving the Saudis the priceless and dangerous gift of nuclear technology. Even if we are able to drill every last drop of domestic reserves and are able to prod OPEC into further feeding our addiction by increasing capacity, we are left with a much greater problem. Our planet will choke on all of that CO2. If a frog is placed in boiling water, it will jump out. But if it is placed in cold water that is slowly heated, it will never jump out. The heat has slowly been turned up on the American consumer, and now they are being boiled alive. The same thing could be said for our planet. A fundamental change is needed in the way America uses energy. Plug-in hybrid cars to get 100 miles to the gallon, advanced cellulosic biofuels that power the fleet on grasses and crop wastes, 
public transportation and more livable cities that reduce the necessity for people to drive everywhere. Today, we will hear that the consensus view is that oil above $100 a barrel is going to be with us for some time. So we have two choices. One, continue exporting our wealth overseas, which drives down the value of the dollar, and hope that American consumers can outbid the Chinese and Indians in the world oil market. Or two, we can commit to blazing a new path, one that frees our country from the shackles of oil and unleashes the renewable energy revolution that will save the planet and drive our economy in the 21st century. The choice is simple. This hearing is very important. Let me turn now and recognize uh, the ranking member uh, of the committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. When a member of Congress starts out by calling his colleague distinguished, that means he disagrees with everything he said. <laughs> so I thank the distinguished chairman for giving me this time. Today's hearing gives the Select Committee a chance to explore what could be the biggest energy issue facing the planet over the coming decades. Oil powers our lives and the economy, making it a vital part of our future. But it's not hard to imagine how some of the reckless policies of the Democratic majority will create a future where energy is scarce and expensive in our country. And by expensive, I mean far more expensive than the Pelosi premium-driven $4 a gallon gas that's already causing grave problems across the country and stretching everybody's budget. While we're hearing calls for energy independence from my friends, we are seeing little action, particularly in the area of gas prices. While prices are skyrocketing, foreign countries like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela are raking in the profits, thanks to the aching pocketbooks of millions of Americans. The United States has many energy resources, so many that I think most Americans would be surprised to know exactly how much energy is available right here in our own country. And I'm sure they would also be surprised to learn how diligently my distinguished colleagues are fighting any expansion of America's capacity to explore for and produce oil and gas. On Monday, Investors Business Daily laid out exactly how much energy there is out there. In the western U.S., it is estimated there is the equivalent of one trillion barrels of oil in shale rock. The Democratic majorities in both the House and Senate voted within the last year to keep shale rock off limits to exploration, despite the fact that these reserves could be as much as three times as large as Saudi Arabia's. And while China and India are drilling 60 miles off Florida's shores, Investors Business Daily noticed that Congress continues to keep 85 percent of America's offshore oil and gas off limits. I don't think that Congress should be picking winners and losers, and I believe that all energy options should be open for consideration. That includes renewable resources like wind and solar. That also includes nuclear power and improved energy efficiency. But certainly expanding our oil and natural gas exploration and production should be a top priority because we know it's there. While technology will help reduce demand for gasoline, the only other thing that can reasonably bring down gasoline prices is an increase in domestic supplies. America needs relief now from high gas prices, and increased production is the best way to get there. After taking control of Congress, the Democrats created this select committee partly to address the issue of energy independence. Yet it seems that the Democrats are throwing up roadblocks to any reasonable proposal that would help free the United States from its reliance on foreign oil. With so much potential oil available, the U.S. should have a bright energy future. However, unless my distinguished friends over here begin to drop some of their roadblocks, I can see a future where gas prices rise higher and higher while Americans suffer more and more. That's not the kind of future I want to imagine, and I hope that my distinguished friends in Congress will work with Republicans in coming months to help create a brighter future for all of us. I thank the chair and yield back the balance of my time. Great. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we now turn and recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and all the distinguished members of this, uh, this panel. Um, I'm glad that the, our esteemed colleague was discussing, I think he said, the Pelosi premium. 
Does that come from the Bush barrel head of oil? Uh, <coughs> I, uh, I think that it's uh, pretty clear, especially um, in recent testimony, when we see that uh, on our own continent, where this administration has already granted uh, in excess of 10,000 permits on millions of acres uh, that companies could be drilling on, that 67 million acres already permitted aren't being drilled on uh, today. One has to wonder why that's the case. Secondly, the policy of this administration, best described by Thomas Friedman, leave no moolah behind where we see the United States going hat in hand to Saudi Arabia to try to uh, get from the Saudis some help and esteem and receive basically a slap in the face. Uh, clearly, when we have the opportunity to invest in alternative energy and we see the Senate time after time block the funding, block the funding necessary to make sure that there is appropriate investment in fuel cell technology, in, uh, in uh, uh, solar, wind. Uh, these are important aspects that need to be followed through as part of any integrated policy. And I hope to be able to ask the distinguished panelists also how they feel about speculators and whether or not speculators are artificially driving the price up. Are the laws of supply and demand suspended during this time because of speculation, and I'll wait to hear and yield back my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I appreciate holding this, him holding this hearing. I think everyone recognizes it's time to do what we can and to be as aggressive as, as humanly possible uh, at moving off of a fossil fuel-based economy. But no expert has come before this testimony and no expert has come before, the, before this committee and no expert has come before the subcommittee on energy of the Commerce Committee on which I serve and said that we can move off of these uh, oil-based uh, fuels uh, overnight, certainly not for a period of years, some as long as uh, beyond 2030. In the meantime, the question is what do we do as Americans face gas prices? Uh, they say the average in the country today is $4.04 .04 a gallon. In my state of Arizona, it's over $4.15 a gallon for regular. Uh, I would suggest for the sake of this nation, this Congress needs to act, and it needs to act now. America is the third largest producer of oil in the world uh, and could be doing far better. We have enacted policies that lock up billions of barrels of, uh, natural of oil and natural gas and we are choosing not to pursue those. Those policies may have made sense when we could buy oil or buy gasoline at $2.50 or $3 a gallon. But when we are forcing the economy on the economy, gas prices of over $4 a gallon, quickly moving to $5 a gallon and perhaps moving to $6 a gallon, uh, those policies simply make no sense. I would echo the comments of the ranking member um, on issue after issue, whether it's Outer Continental Shelf, whether it's the Intermountain West, whether it's oil shale where the U.S. House recently imposed a moratorium, or whether it's Anwar, we have made a decision as a nation to lock up our current supply, and virtually 90 percent of the Democrats in this Congress have voted against supply vote after vote after vote for the last 15 years, and virtually 90 percent of Republicans have voted to increase supply on vote after vote after vote over the last 15 years. Uh, I don't think you can look backward at those votes and criticize them now, but it is important to look forward because we have to do something about this problem for the sake of the working men and women of America and for the sake of our nation's economy. <coughs> and with that, I yield back. Great. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to again thank you and our witnesses for being here today to hold this very uh, important hearing on the future of oil. The price of oil hit a record high of 138 per barrel in June of this year, an increase of over 600 percent since 2002. In the district that I represent in East Los Angeles in California, the price of gasoline is over 460, and that's not even premium. Uh, our economy and our national security, as you know, is very vulnerable as a result of our nation's dependence on oil. Government-owned and operated companies such as the National Iranian Oil Company in Iran represent the top 10 holders of oil reserves internationally. While domestic demand is expected to grow, 
from 21 million barrels per day to about 25 million barrels per day in 2030, our domestic supply of oil, as we know, is limited. This includes reserves which are already accessible to oil companies for production, yet are not being developed. Why? Domestically, companies have stockpiled near, nearly 10,000 drilling permits, as was stated earlier, which they are not developing. Again, why? One quarter of the public lands and water available for energy development are actually in production. Why? Why can't we drill? We, well, in, in my opinion, we can't drill our way out of this problem. And if the United States was to rely on domestic resources to meet all of our current consumption, all proven reserves would be exhausted in three years. The only long-term sustainable secure solution is to reduce our demand on oil. And I do believe that the Pelosi solution is and was the Energy Independence and Security Act, which became law last December, which increased the fuel economy standards to 35 miles per gallon at a 40 percent increase over current levels. Those are the kinds of activities that this Congress is undertaking, and I'm proud to be a part of that uh, plan that uh, Speaker Pelosi has put forward. And we need more revitalization, renewable energies, and other sources of fuel to get our security independence in order. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Great. Uh, the gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the hearing. And to our witnesses, we appreciate very much that you are here. I don't think there's anyone that denies that the current global market is enduring a period of record prices and tight supplies and increasing demand. And that is where I think we need to focus, <coughs> is on that supply and demand issue. As we hear the platitudes and the prognostication, we know that what we have done in this country is we have kept our ability to get to our supply. Quite frankly, I'm one of those members that I think the smartest thing we could do would be to repeal the provisions from last year's Energy Independence and Security Act because we are making it impossible to explore for American soil on American oil. And the American people are really quite offended that the most creative thing that has come out of this 110th Congress to address energy <clears throat> issues is to repeal the light bulb. That does not help them when they're paying over $4 a gallon at the pump. And quite frankly, we know that there are worldwide reserves that would take care of the next 30 years at the current rate of consumption. We know that there are American reserves that are off limits and it would handle, it would give us a sufficient supply for 100 years. So yes, we need to be looking at what we're going to do as Americans to find an American solution to this problem short-term, mid-range, and long-term answers that will address the needs of our nation. And I am looking forward to hearing from each of you how you think we should best address it in the short term, right now, mid-range, with the next 20 years, and in the long term. Where is thoughtful innovation heading? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the reality is that as we sit here today discussing our future and oil's future, we are really taking a look at whether our country's future will be prosperous or painful. We're at a clear fork in the road and must choose which path to take. In one direction, there is the path that leads in the direction of business as usual, based on oil as the prime mover of our vehicles and our economy. With gas prices at record highs, all we hear from the oil companies, their allies in Congress, is we need to drill, drill, drill for more oil here at home. Well, I would ask you, with uh, all deference to my distinguished colleagues on the other side of the aisle, who is stopping you? About 75 percent of the oil in the United States is on land that is already open for production, but less than one-third of that land is actually being used by the oil companies. They are literally sitting on 10,000 permits and millions of acres of leased land that they've already uh, paid for that would let them start pulling more oil out of the ground. Our President George W. Bush said when oil was only $50 a, a barrel that there should be no need for more incentive for oil companies uh, to drill for oil. Now at 135, I can't imagine that there's more incentive. So I'm wondering why are they sitting on uh, millions of acres of already leased land here in the United States? It's ready to drill, 
drill away. But at the same time, if we're going to move further toward the drilling and burning of oil, we must also be ready for more extreme weather events, more tornadoes, more floods, more 11 inches of rain in one day in Indiana or Kansas, three record 50-year floods in my district in the space of five years, uh, more drought in the southeast, et cetera. These are the computer projections of climate change that the consumption of oil and other carbon-based fuels lead to. So I, I just say that it's, uh, we can and uh, we may wind up uh, drilling for and using a lot more oil, but we should be moving for the economy and for the, and for the uh, environment's sake uh, toward a renewable future. I yield back. The, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you calling this a very important hearing. I think uh, the American citizenry is looking toward this Congress to work in a bipartisan fashion to uh, effect some change and, and some hope uh, for what's happening with these uh, gasoline prices, with the oil prices. I think the uh, cost of uh, gas has got the ability actually to cripple our economy probably more than any other single factor. Uh, and it's manifesting itself in so many various ways. I mean, we see the airlines merging with uh, Northwest and Delta uh, merging almost uh, uh, for a number of reasons, but probably foremost because of the price of uh, fuel. Uh, from Michigan, coming from Michigan, I see what is happening uh, with our auto industry. Certainly uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we've had uh, General Motors announcing that they're closing a number of plants uh, that are produ producing uh, SUVs and uh, trucks. and various things, and you hear the, uh, uh, the folks at GM saying that almost overnight the buying patterns of the American public is, is changing and they think it will be a permanent thing. Uh, we see it impacting uh, the rail, um, <laughs> every mode of uh, transportation, and because of the way that we structured our society with so many people commuting long distances, uh, et cetera, it is, as I say, it has the, uh, has the ability to uh, impact uh, more than anything as we go into a, a, season, a tourism season. It's uh, impacting, again, in Michigan and in every state, I think, uh, in the uh, agricultural industry, uh, in every way. And uh, I think there are a number of um, uh, proposals that are out there, uh, and I'm very interested to hearing the uh, panel today. And again, I think the uh, American public is looking to this Congress uh, to uh, effect some meaningful, uh, comprehensive uh, energy policy that will have an impact uh, on their ability to uh, uh, fill up their gasoline tanks, and I look forward to uh, hearing the witnesses' testimony. Thank you. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this uh, timely hearing. The high price of gas uh, is hurting businesses and communities throughout our country. In fact, the most recent Lundberg survey, which compares average fuel prices nationwide, lists Stockton, California, in my district is having the highest average gas prices anywhere. Uh, at more than $4.50 a gallon, uh, people are struggling. <clears throat> and with these high prices, people are inevitably asking two questions. Why are the prices of gas so high? And what are we doing about it? Thankfully, we can tell them that the Congress has taken some badly needed steps, both in the near term and the long term. It's essential that we pursue policies that will lower prices now and redouble our efforts to increase efficiency, investing in new technology, and ultimately work to wean our country from foreign oil. Today's hearings should answer some of the questions of why oil prices and gas prices are so high. Clearly, the world demand is up while production has stagnated. Rampant speculation drives the price of oil higher. And we remain at the mercy of, control, of government controlled oil companies and international cartels. We've taken action by stopping strategic petroleum reserve uh, deposits, by mandating new efficiency standards, and by providing explicit authority to the administration to investigate gas gouging. While oil companies are demanding additional drilling rights, which they claim will lower the price of gas, they're only using 26 percent of the area they already have for drilling. If we encourage innovation to increase efficiency and find new forms of energy, we can keep ahead of the oil price increases and maintain our high standard of living. This is America's great historic challenge and our opportunity. I yield back. I, th I thank the gentleman. And uh, now we will uh, recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee, for an opening statement. 
Uh, thank you. We know one thing for sure. As long as we remain dependent on dead dinosaurs for our transportation, we're doomed to price hikes, global warming, and the security concerns associated with the fact that the dinosaurs went to die under the Mideast sands. We don't know how that happened, but it did. We have got to replace an old resource of oil, oil with a new resource of intellectual capital. And that is happening across America today. And our fundamental challenge is to get on with the business of hastening this giant clean energy revolution that's now happening across the country. It's happening at the Sapphire Energy Company in California that's developing a gasoline made from algae. It's happening at the A123 Battery Company in Boston that's making the lithium ion batteries that are going to power the GM Volt, a plug-in hybrid car. Car. It's happening at the Phoenix Motor Car Company, a company I'm meeting with this afternoon. Going to have an electric car that runs 100 miles just on a charge. It's happening at the Bright Source Solar Thermal Company that's developing solar thermal energy with zero CO2 input. What do all those companies have in common? They're not based on dead dinosaurs. They're based on living geniuses. And those are living American geniuses. And one of the things Mr. Shattuck said, my friend, said, that this revolution is not going to take place overnight. None of us can promise the American people to congressional snap of the finger to create these new technologies overnight. They are going to take years, if not decades. But that is a reason to start today, not to wait another three years. The fact that this may take a, a year or two means it's more important to start today rather than less important. And that's why the debates we're having are the debates between the optimists on this side of the aisle who believe in the power of this intellectual capital and some pessimists who want to remain addicted to dead dinosaurs. That's what the debate is. Let's move forward on clean energy revolution. Great. The, gentleman's, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, and all time for opening statements from the members of the Select Committee has been completed. And now we'll turn to our very distinguished panel. And our first witness, who is uh, Mr. Paul Caruso. Uh, he has been the administrator of the Energy Information Administration for the past six years. Um, and uh, obviously, there can't be a more important job in the United States uh, government today than uh, Mr. Caruso and the recommendations which he makes to Congress uh, and to the American people. So we welcome you, um, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to appear today be, to discuss the long-term outlook for oil in the United States and globally. The Energy Information Administration, EIA, is the independent statistical and analytical agency within the Department of Energy. And as such, we do not promote, formulate, or take positions on policy matters. In our view, should not be construed as representing those of the Department of Energy or the administration. Uh, in your, op in your uh, invitation letter, you asked about our current forecast for gasoline prices. Our June short-term energy outlook uh, issued yesterday projects that regular, gas regular grade motor gasoline retail prices will average $3.78 per gallon this year. That's 97 cents per gallon above the 2007 average with the monthly average prices uh, projected to peak at 415 in August nationwide. Crude oil prices for low sulfur light grades are projected to average $122 per barrel in 08 and $126 per barrel in 2009, compared with $72 last year. I think it's important to, uh, when you're discussing the long-term outlook for oil and liquid fuels, to start with a clear set of definitions. And the first table in my written testimony shows the estimated global quantities for six categories of liquid fuels. We use the term oil to refer to uh, the first four, which are conventional crude oil, lease condensate, natural gas, liquids, refinery gain, and unconventional crude oil, including Canadian oil sands, shale oil, and very heavy crude oil. We use the term liquids to refer to oil plus biofuels and liquid fuels manufactured using coal and natural gas. These distinctions are important because the conventional crude oil share of total liquid fuel supply, which was 84 percent in 2006, is projected to decline to between 62 
and 72 percent of total global liquid supply in 2030 in both in the reference and high case, uh, high price cases as discussed in the written testimony. Last December, as several members have noted, the Energy Independence and Security Act was passed and signed by the uh, by Congress and signed by the President. And the specific provisions that have the most significant implications for future oil markets are the updates to the corporate average fuel economy cafe standards for new light duty vehicles and to the re and the renewable fuel standard. Taken together, the updates to these two standards in ISA produce a substantial reduction in oil use and oil imports in our long-term outlook. EIA estimates that the combined effects of the CAFE and RFS update are to reduce U.S. oil use by about 2 million barrels per day by 2030. EIA's annual energy outlook it illustrates the importance, the impacts of high oil prices by developing and, and reporting projected projections for several alternative oil price paths. High oil prices can be expected to reduce U.S. liquids consumption, increase domestic production, and reduce the nation's reliance on imported oil. Generally, the responsiveness to both, of both supply and demand to higher prices grows over time. Reflecting consumers' response to high prices, oil use in the transportation sector in 2030 is nearly 6 percent lower in the high price case than in the reference case. Higher prices also result in fuel switching between liquids and other energy in the industrial sector. Turning to supply, projected domestic crude oil production in the high oil price case, as shown in Figure 4 of the written testimony, is 6.4 million barrels a day compared to the 2006 level of 5.1. By dampening the demand for liquid fuels and increasing the domestic production of crude oil and biofuels, higher oil prices, prices together with the CAFE and RFS provisions in ISA substantially reduce projected U.S. oil imports. In 2006, U.S. oil imports were 12.4 million barrels a day, accounting for 60 percent of our total liquid fuel use. And in the AEO 2008 high price case, oil imports are expected to provide 44 percent of our total projected liquid fuel use in 2030. Higher oil prices will also affect global liquid fuels and oil markets. In AEO 2008 high price case, global liquid consumption grows from 85 million barrels a day in 2006 to 98 million barrels per day in 2030, significantly below the reference case a consumption level of 113 million barrels per day in 2030. Higher oil prices also affect the projected mix of global liquids production. Liquids production from sources other than conventional oil in the AEO high price case is 19 million barrels per day higher in 2030 than in 2006, compared to an increase of only 11 million barrels a day in the reference case. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, both the reference and high price case in the AEO 2008 <coughs> suggest that liquids will continue as a primary global fuel through 2030, although they are expected to re represent a declining share in the total energy mix, the share of oil, and especially conventional oil in the overall liquid, liquids mix is also expected to decline. In the high oil, in the high oil price case, overall liquids to 2030 use grows by about 15 percent, while conventional crude oil production declines by more than 15 percent. Policy decisions taken by this body and others will make it expected to be a key driver in, in changing this business as usual outlook. And we certainly look forward to working with uh, you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and other committees in this Congress to provide the best data and analysis to help you make your choices. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Caruso, very much. Our next uh, witness is Adam Siminski, who is the Chief Energy Economist for uh, Deutsche Bank. Uh, he has spent his life uh, uh, analyzing uh, energy uh, uh, markets and uh, uh, 
uh, climate change, commodity prices, uh, and uh, uh, energy uh, um, uh, economics. And we uh, welcome you, sir. Uh, whenever you are ready, please begin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And uh, in the spirit of the discussions I had when I was asked to come today, uh, I was talking with both the majority and the minority staff. And uh, listening to some of the discussions going back and forth here this morning, uh, what I'd like to offer as a suggestion is that uh, the ideas that have been proposed on both sides of the aisle are not mutually exclusive. In fact, the National Petroleum Council uh, did a report uh, about a year ago, uh, came to the same conclusion, saying that uh, we are having supply problems and, uh, but we're not running out of resources, and to mitigate the risks on the supply side, we need to expand just about everything that we can do. All economic energy sources are going to be required to solve the problems that we're having. Coal, nuclear, renewables, unconventional oil and gas, uh, getting acreage opened up or worrying about uh, the low proportion of acreage that's being drilled on uh, doesn't seem to me to be the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is what is the resource that's on those acres and where are the resources and can you get at those resources? Uh, if the oil is in Alaska or offshore, uh, then those are the acres that need to be opened up, um, you know, not, not the other ones. Uh, the other thing that the National Petroleum Council said was that uh, we really do need to look at demand management on the energy side. Policies designed to moderate growing uh, demand for energy and increasing efficiency in transportation, residential, commercial, industrial uses should really be encouraged. So I applaud uh, the ideas that have come out here. And I think we should move on all of these, not just some of them. There's no silver bullet to solving the problems that we have in the energy area. We've got to do it all. And we needed to do it yesterday. So the sooner we get on with it, uh, the happier I believe the American uh, consumers and voters are going to be. Um, I tried to answer the questions that were submitted to me by the staff, and they're in my testimony, and they'll be in the record. Uh, but rather than to go into all of that, what I'd like to offer is uh, another suggestion about what has changed? Everybody is looking at the price of oil and saying, well, nothing has changed in the last year. Why is the price of oil up so much? There must be uh, some underlying conspiracy or problem. And let me offer two things that have changed very dramatically in the last year and that I think uh, have given us the situation that we're in. First, the U.S. economy has slowed down, but it has not spilled over into the rest of the world where energy demand and especially oil demand are still growing very strongly. And in fact, if you look at the projections, uh, you know, we may be on an overall global basis be at 110 million barrels a day of demand by the year 2030, some 95, 96 or 97 million barrels a day by 2015. The second thing that's changed is that uh, there is an accumulating amount of evidence suggesting that we may actually run into a problem of being able to deliver more than 95 or 100 million barrels a day of oil, not because of a resource issue, but because of access issues, getting access to the places that have the oil. If we can't do that, then there is going to be a problem because demand is going to be a lot higher than supply. That situation or potential situation, I think, is what's informing the markets that are lifting prices to try to find some way to rebalance in everybody's models for where the future of the oil market lies, to rebalance those models, and it's probably going to require a higher price. Well, since, uh, since we're uh, looking for, you know, what are these reasons, let me just mention some of them. Uh, underlying drivers for prices, in my view, are very diverse and involve a lot of fundamental supply and demand issues. One, OPEC production and capacity issues. Two, demand in China and the Middle East, where consumption is subsidized and economic growth has been fast. Three, the normal lags in capital spending in the oil industry and the erosion of that spending by cost inflation. Four, central bank policies, very low interest rates fostering high economic growth, cheap money, and a very weak dollar. Five, geopolitical issues, as I mentioned, in places like Russia, Venezuela, Iran, Iraq, Nigeria, and elsewhere that are keeping supplies off the market. Mr. Chairman, we haven't had a huge 
energy crisis appear, but a series of mini crises. It's sort of we're having the afterquakes without having the big one ahead of time. Uh, fifth, uh, six, political decisions themselves. Corn ethanol is a good example of unintended consequences and the ability to get uh, other legislation uh, passed on both conservation efficiency and supply is an issue. And uh, finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, since I think I'm probably going to be asked about this, uh, I've excluded speculation uh, in the sense of rising funds flow into the futures markets uh, from index funds and hedge funds as a reason for the price increase. Volumes in futures really don't matter as much as sentiment. The sentiment is that supply isn't growing fast enough to meet demand, and that's causing prices to rise. If we can do things in the United States with the help of our elected representatives to get demand to slow down and to get the supply of all of our energy sources to begin to rise, I'm not allowed to give guarantees as, as a financial analyst, but as close as I can come to giving a guarantee, I believe that you'll see oil prices going back down if we can get supplies growing and demand slowing down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Siminski, very much. Our next witness is Ann Myers Jaffe. She is the uh, Wallace Wilson Fellow uh, for Energy Studies at the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. Uh, we welcome you to the Select Committee. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Could you turn on your microphone, please? I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and the honor to be able to address this committee uh, that has done excellent work over the past uh, year. Uh, I want to give you uh, the visual image of two things. Uh, if you remember the cartoon Roadrunner, so imagine that the America is Wile E. Coyote and he's run off the cliff and he's still spinning his legs, uh, but gravity hasn't hit. That's where we are on the energy crisis right now. We're still on the level of land and we don't understand how deep the problem is. Uh, uh, and I, if you excuse me for saying this, in thinking about the Congress, uh, you're like deer with your uh, eyes in the headlights, right? Where, where people understand the magnitude of the problem, uh, but they haven't understood how large the magnitude is in terms of the need to get beyond partisan ideas, right? So I second Adam in his uh, suggestion that the body needs to get beyond its current thinking because we're in a serious problem that over time could become a catastrophic problem, but it could become a manageable problem if we would have smart and sound public policy. And let me just say that ethanol was not a sound and smart public policy. And so therefore, in thinking about what we need to do, we need to think comprehensively uh, because we're importing between 12 and 13 million barrels a day of oil. Our imports last month were 13.5 million barrels a day of oil. And ultimately, uh, that volume is so large and it's going to grow so much more that coming up with these little solutions that help somebody's district is not going to solve the problem. So we need to move away from false choices. Right? We need to come up with concrete policies. We need to both curb demand growth. We need to increase what I call the substitutability. Uh, one of the reasons why you're having a hearing on oil and gasoline and not on electricity is because we have many different fuels we use to generate electricity in this country, and none of them are oil. Right? That is something that was a positive feature of, uh, of the 1970s. Most Americans no longer heat their homes with heating oil, right? So there's a whole range of problems with, that have been sort of eased uh, since the 70s because we have enhanced our substitutability in certain areas. We need to do that in transportation. Transportation now is 100% or 99% oil-based. Uh, we now see the emerging technologies where we could diversify that. Right? And, and if we look at the wonderful projections that the DOEs and others have done, we know that something like 75 percent of the increase in world demand for oil is going to come from the transportation sector. Now, getting at this issue between drilling versus demand, 
Uh, the reality is, and Rice University spent two years going into the SEC filings of all the American oil companies, and I welcome you to come, have your staffers come to the web and look at that study. Uh, the reality is that between 2006 and 2007, uh, the five largest oil companies only increased their exploration spending by 10%. I mean, that's pretty shocking. I could understand that in 2000 or 2002, when we all said, geez, they should be spending more, they felt cautious about how much of their cash flow to spend. But over the last year, it seems kind of amazing. I think all of you are, are important people in your own right, in your own areas. If you were the chairman of a company and you saw the commodity price for your entity rising the way it has, uh, I would think that you would have increased spending a little bit more. Right. Uh, the second thing that's happened in the last year uh, is not only did the majors not increase their exploration spending dramatically, though in fairness to them they did make some big boosts in 2006, uh, but remember costs have gone up 100 percent, so even if they're increasing, uh, if they're increasing under, you know, 50 or 100 percent, they're not increasing at all, right? Uh, that we also see in 2007 that OPEC has announced virtually no new projects for expanding oil fields. And in fact, um, Saudi Arabia announced within the last few months that they're freezing their expansion plans, that they're happy with their plans to go to 12.5 million barrels a day uh, by 2009. Uh, but their previous plans to add new fields to go to 15 million barrels a day seem unnecessary, so they're not going to continue with those plans. In addition, if you look at the research and development spending of our five largest oil companies that are collecting $160 billion in operating cash flow uh, in 2007, they spent together, all five companies, $3.3 billion on R&D. Uh, that is half the annual R&D budget for General Motors or Microsoft. So again, in an age where we need new technologies and uh, a, a new, uh, uh, new investment, uh, we're not getting the momentum. Now, just a couple of quick facts. Uh, we have done simulations. Uh, if the offshore continental shelf was open to drilling without restrictions, we could expect uh, a 7 or 8 percent rise in natural gas production, so that's about 1.5 uh, trillion cubic feet higher. Um, and then after about 20, by 2015 and then after that, we could expect a 10 percent increase each year. And if then, you, if, if you could, uh, if you could if, please summarize. Sure. And then in, uh, in oil, we could expect another million to two million barrels a day. If we could get our cars in America to average 50 miles to the gallon, uh, that would mean we could shave six to seven million barrels a day off of demand by 2025. If you could summarize, please. Okay, so in summary, uh, we've seen other countries uh, have more effective energy policy. Uh, Japan is a leader now in automotive technology, and instead of closing factories, uh, they regulated their industry and then also gave them R&D tax breaks to make sure that the cars that they would be selling now would get 30 to 50 miles to the gallon. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We appreciate it uh, very much. Um, Ms. Chaffin, you'll have plenty of opportunity in the question and answer period to expound upon your points. Uh, let's now turn to our next uh, witness, uh, who is uh, Ethan Manuel. He is the director of the Lands Protection Program for the Sierra Club. Uh, we welcome you, uh, sir, whenever uh, you are ready. Please begin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Minority Member, members of the committee. Good morning. My name is Ethan Manuel, and I uh, direct the Lands Program for the Sierra Club. Sierra Club, and I'm here representing over 750,000 Sierra Club members who belong to more than 65 chapters and 45 groups around the country, and that makes us the largest grassroots environmental organization in the country. And before I start, I'm, I'm a little confused as to how I should begin. I, I've, I've come to some of these hearings before, and I know a lot of times uh, witnesses open by uh, hailing the Red Sox, but uh, now with the Celtics in the finals, I'm not sure what is the correct way to pander to the chairman on that, so... Uh, <laughs> My You're doing a good job. Uh, there we go. <laughs> but uh, turning to the, for the future of oil, I want to mainly discuss two, uh, two issues. One is uh, just gas prices, and the second one is access to uh, re uh, resources here in the United States. A lot of the uh, members have already mentioned this. Some of my panelists have mentioned it, too, that we all know Americans are paying a record amount of uh, prices for a gallon of gas, over $4 a gallon. And it's disappointing when you consider that uh, we were first 
put on notice about gas prices almost, you know, almost 40 years ago when the first Arab oil shock. And it's disappointing from our perspective to see that 35, 40 years later, we're still dependent on fossil fuels like oil, oil uh, fossil, uh, natural gas, and coal. And uh, in addition to pandering about the Red Sox, I've got to talk about myself a little bit more. I'm a Greek American, and my parents love quoting the ancient Greeks and uh, like Homer, but in this case, I've got to quote Homer Simpson. So I'm glad I'm not, I'm not making the first cartoon reference, but you know, Homer Simpson says, "Stupidity got us into this mess, and stupidity will get us out." And that's the uh, disappointing part about this. Some of the energy policies being promoted that it calls for more drilling when drilling ha is really the problem. And, and all, we've, all we've got to show for, an, for a pretty aggressive drilling for the last 35 years is, again, $4, a gallon, for, $4 for a gallon of gas. If we are truly addicted to oil and gas, which P President Bush said in a recent State of the Union address, we clearly think the answer is not to seek a bigger fix by drilling in special places like the Arctic Refuge or off of our coasts and off of our beaches. Uh, when, in, when looking at the Arctic Refuge in particular, the Energy Information Administration admitted or uh, released a report last week that mentioned that peak production, which wouldn't be until 2027, the effect on prices of the pump, if any, would be a few pennies from drilling in the Arctic Refuge. So we don't think drilling there is the solution or would reduce prices. By contrast, EIA research indicates that clean energy and energy efficiency technologies could do 10 times more to help reduce our dangerous dependence on foreign oil and fossil fuels. The same example holds true for the Outer Continental Shelf. If you look at the Eastern Gulf of Mexico in particular, which is kind of the area of highest industry interest, there's only about 930 million barrels of oil thought to be in that area. Again, against current rates of consumption, that's just not much oil, certainly not enough oil to, again, reduce the price of gas that consumers pay at the pump. Again, looking at the OCS, a vast majority, 80 percent of the nation's undiscovered, technically recoverable oil and gas is located in areas that are already open for drilling, according to the Department of the Interior. And Ms. Solis mentioned that in her opening statement, that even if we drilled everywhere in the United States, we wouldn't have enough supply to impact prices or to, uh, to help consumers at the pump. Finally, on access, uh, again, many of the opening statements mentioned how the uh, oil companies have access to quite a few areas, both onshore and offshore. A new report by the, uh, the Natural Resources Committee here in the House uh, mentioned that uh, the permitting of uh, drilling permits has exploded in recent years, going from 3,800 five years ago to more than 7,500 in 2007. The same is true onshore and offshore, whether we're looking at our public lands, uh, BLM lands, or offshore. Clearly, we think that more drilling and leasing in the United States will not lower uh, gas prices. We just simply, again, don't have that much oil and gas left in the United States. As, again, some of my other, pan the other panelists have said this morning, the price of oil is set on the world market, largely by OPEC. It's also influenced by speculation, increases in demand in Asia and China and India, and by a weak dollar. And again, we don't think leasing and drilling is not going to solve that problem. Uh, this year, there have been two huge leases held in the Chukchi Sea and in the Gulf of Mexico, and obviously prices have still gone up. And, it's, and again, that the, these large leases indicate, I mean, underscore the issue that uh, there's no lack of access to areas here in the United States. And if you look back again 30 years, we've, since the first Arab oil shock in the early 70s, we've, the U.S. has produced almost 90 billion barrels of oil since then. So we've tried drilling our way out of the problem, and it just hasn't worked. Uh, fortunately, we think now this new Congress is starting to take steps to solve the problem. Last year, under the uh, leadership of Mr. Markey and other members of Congress, Congress did uh, pass uh, increases in fuel economy standards for the first time. There are many innovative programs being offered this year by members of Congress to get us off of fossil fuels and more re more, use more renewables. And we think that is clearly the best way to go when looking at energy policy. So when, when we look at the future of oil, we hope that we really see a future of clean, renewable energy and energy efficiency programs. We really ha are optimistic that America can innovate our way out of this problem. And instead of doing the failed policies of the past, which is, again, more and more drilling everywhere here in the United States, we should look towards energy efficiency solutions, clean energy programs, and renewables that would, solve, that would get us off of fossil fuels, reduce global warming pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and put Americans to work on a clean energy future, not a future of oil. But thank you for the, chair, for the time, Mr. Chairman, and for the invitation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Manuel, very much. And our final witness is Karen Hobart, the Vice President and Managing Director of the Institute for 21st Century Energy. Uh, she has been an Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs at the U.S. Department of uh, Energy. We welcome you, Ms. Hobart. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the Ranking Members and Members of the Committee. 
At the Institute for 21st Century Energy, we believe an affordable, diverse, and secure energy supply is fundamental to our future national security and the expansion of American economic opportunity and prosperity. America needs a comprehensive, common-sense energy policy with a long-term view and durable policy and fiscal commitments. It's no surprise to tell you all that we do not have that now. It will take unprecedented political commitment from the Congress and the executive branch, better partnerships with local and state governments, and much improved relationships with the private sector. We need to be honest about what it's going to take. We need to stop penalizing, demonizing, regulating, and picking winners. We need to instead stimulate investment, incentivize, and innovate solutions to address the greatest threat to the 21st century energy, 21st century. I'm not going to talk about demand growth because that's been covered. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening in the oil market and then what we need to do about it. Resources are located in places that are geologically difficult to get to, geographically very difficult. They're in places that are politically unstable and they're unfriendly to new investment. National oil companies own 50 to 80 percent of the world's proven oil reserves. Energy sector exploration and development costs have risen, and yet the share devoted to exploration has fallen. We are seeing growing resource nationalism around the world. We don't have enough energy professionals. We don't have enough equipment. And NIMBY is a thing of the past. We are now on to banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. And even nope, not on planet Earth not on planet Earth. That is an unsustainable path to sustain our economic competitiveness if we want to do that. We are not running out of resources. That's simply untrue. We are running out of access to the resources. The International Energy Agency estimates we have six to seven trillion barrels of conventional oil in place around the world. Our U.S. Geological Survey estimates that we have 3.345 trillion recoverable barrels around the world. And if you take out what's already been produced, that leaves anywhere between one and a half to three and a half trillion barrels of oil still available. But we have to be able to open markets. We have to be able to have transparent trade and we have to have fair market pricing of energy. And we need to capitalize on our resources here at home. The U.S. is still the largest producer of energy, but we still have significant resources that the Congress and the executive branch have put off limits for exploration. Our Mineral Management Service estimates we have 139 billion barrels of undiscovered oil here in the United States. 80% of the Outer Continental Shelf is off limits. That part alone, if we would just use that part of the oil, we would have actually a 35-year supply for gasoline for our cars. We would have heating oil for the millions of homes for the next hundred of years. We are depriving the American consumer of choice and opportunity. May, there was a Gallup poll that demonstrated a huge change in public opinion. 41% used to believe that drilling off our coasts and in the wilderness areas should be off limits. 57% now support it. We need to listen to the American people and their pocketbooks. We need to develop a comprehensive plan and we need the comprehensive plan to embrace the following concepts. We need to increase and diversify supply. We need to increase our suppliers. We need to improve energy efficiency. That is the next best source of energy is the one we currently waste. We have to accelerate technology development and deployment and invest in it with regularity and predictability. We have to increase the use of alternatives and renewable sources of energy. Yes, we need to improve our environmental stewardship. We have to modernize our infrastructure. It's not enough to get the hydrocarbons if we can't get them to where they need to be. And we need to exert international leadership. We need it all. We must allow for increased domestic oil and gas supplies. We have to recognize the role of nuclear power, an emissions-free source of power. We need clean coal. We need to use the 250 years of coal we have here. We have to emphasize energy efficiency and renewables. We have to update our aging energy infrastructure. We have to be better environmental stewards, and we have to develop, deploy those clean technologies that will improve our trade imbalances and accelerate American competitiveness. If we unleash that entrepreneurial power that has helped us in many crises in the past, we can make widespread use of technology to use our coal. We can generate a second, we can create a second generation of biofuels that will not conflict with food demands. We can build safe emissions-free nuclear power plants and we can drill responsibly on and off of our shores. But we have to inform the public and policymakers with due respect about the huge challenge we're in the choices we have and the urgency of this matter. We have to consider the trade-offs, the costs, and the feasibility 
and viability of what we are proposing. We need less rhetoric. We need more facts. There's no single solution, no single fuel. We must embrace all sources. I'd like to leave you with the thought that the decisions we make, this Congress makes, the next Congress and the next President, those decisions we make in the next few years, we will be with those decisions for generations to come. We need to take it responsibly, seriously. The stakes are enormous for our competitiveness and for our national security. And we at the Institute for 21st Century Energy look forward to being a constructive and integral part of the deliberation this country desperately needs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hobart, very much. And now we will turn to questions from uh, the uh, select uh, committee members. Uh, and the chair recognizes himself. Uh, Mr. Caruso, um, I'm wondering why it is that your, uh, your agency is uh, uh, predicting that the price of oil is going to go below $57 a barrel <clears throat> in 2016. And then even further out, uh, you're predicting that the price of a barrel of oil is going down uh, to $70 a, a barrel by 2030. So on the one hand, uh, America believes that we're in an energy crisis. Uh, and I think that all of us really feel that. What your projections are in your agency is by 2016, uh, the price will be pretty much cut in half, and by 2030, it really gets even better because these are constant dollars. How can you explain that? It doesn't make any sense to people that the price of oil is going to be going down. Well, just to start off with a point of clarification, those uh, prices you quoted are the assumptions for the world oil price in our annual energy outlook that was released uh, several months ago. And they are only one of a number of scenarios that we look at. We, but we the, problem, the problem, Mr. Caruso, the, the problem with that is that the um, NHTSA, the Department of Transportation, uses those projections to then determine what the cost-benefit analysis is for increasing the fuel economy standards for the vehicles that we have to drive in 2016 and 2020 and 2030. So if you give them that number, then the cost benefit, of course, is much lower in terms of the benefit to America. The higher the prices, if you were projecting $4 a, a gallon or $5 a gallon, well, then NHTSA is free to increase by 5 or 6 or 7 miles per gallon mm -hmm. the efficiency of the vehicles by 2020 or 2030. So your number is very relevant because it goes right to the question of the pressure which is going to be applied um, to the wilderness areas in the United States. The more efficient the vehicles, we put 70 percent of all oil we consume in vehicles, is the less pressure there is to drill in pristine uh, wilderness areas. So your projection is, I think, way off. I don't think it's even remotely close uh, to where the price of oil is going to be, and it has a profound impact then on all the other decisions which are made. Well, the point is well taken that the NHTSA does use the reference case. We do give them the uh, high price case, which in nominal dollars goes to $180 in uh, one. In, Would you uh, recommend, Mr. Caruso, that the Department of Transportation use the high case scenario in planning for what the efficiency of the vehicles that Americans drive in 2020 and 2030 should be? Or do you think that they should use $2.26 a gallon in? 2016 and $2.51 in 2030 as the basis for their planning as to what the efficiency of the vehicles that we drive should be? Well, of course, that's obviously the uh, prerogative of NHTSA, but I, uh, I, we're on the higher price path right now. If you were to ask me today what would I use, I would use the higher price. You would use the higher price, but NHTSA doesn't. NHTSA has to use your lower price. So I would recommend to the Bush administration that they change this formula. Uh, and that they not use this low uh, cost uh, for, per gallon of gasoline as the basis for the fuel economy standards for the vehicles which we drive. Let me just go down. Yes or no, uh, Mr. Semensky, should they use a high cost or should, do you think 2026 20, per gallon in 2016 is a good way for America to plan the efficiency of our vehicles? Well, Mr. Chairman, my experience with forecasting is, is that it hasn't worked out all that well. Um, so. I would suggest. No, as a nation, right, what as would a, you plan for? 
I would think looking at a range would make a lot of sense. Uh, now, what would you plan for if you were the government? Would you plan for 226 a gallon in current dollars in 2016 and 251 in 2030, or would you plan for four dollars a gallon in if, terms of what our automotive fleet should average? If, if I were making this as yes. a policy decision, yes. I would plan for the worst. Which okay, is thank you, Ms. Ms. Jaffe. What would you plan for? I Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Mr. Manuel, what would you plan for? Well, I, I can't really answer. I plan for the worst. Thank you. You would plan for? Yeah, probably for the worst. The worst. And, and hope for uh, the best. Ms. Hybert, what would you plan for if you were the Bush administration right now uh, using what the projected price for gasoline for consumers would be in 2016 and 2030? But you know, it's a little more complicated than that because you have to affix the mandates that you're going to impose with technology availability. You have to introduce when is the technology going to be available. I understand that. What would you plan for? You're the Chamber of Commerce. You're, the cha you're planning. The Chamber the of Commerce is, is planning the for what the price for all of its members are going to be in 2016 and 2030, Ms. Hubbard. Would you plan for $2 and uh, $26 a gallon for all of your members? To, uh, or, uh, or, uh, by 2016, $2.51, or would you recommend that the government plan that there be a much higher price and therefore adjust what, their, what the expectations are from the transportation sector? I will note that the BP statistical uh, outlook, which just came out, noted that they thought 105 was a fair price. That was according to BP. $105 a barrel. Oh, so you're, in, in other words, you're not, but you, so in other words, you don't think that planning for 226 is, makes any sense at all? I think we have to be realistic about the prices going forward, and I don't know how exactly everybody does the different forecasting, but clearly the well, trend is Well, your original testimony was very frightening. And now I'm asking you, do you think it makes sense for them to be projecting 226 again? I don't think we need to make our policy decisions based purely on forecasts. We need to make common sense, comprehensive solutions available I that are not so just I'm, based I'm on forecasts. I'm asking you a specific question. We put 70 percent of the oil into gasoline tanks. That's 70 percent of all oil. Do you think that no this forecast is can adequately predict why last Friday the price of oil went up eleven dollars? So forecasts are useful guideposts, but you cannot make concrete policy decisions based solely on forecasts. Uh, well, I, I, if we're not going to be basically learning from what is going on right now in our economy with these high prices, the testimony about India, about China, about all the other pressures and turn to the transportation sector and solve the problem, then I'm afraid that the Chamber of Commerce in 2016 and 2030 is going to be ravaged by prices that will be 6 and 7 and $8 a, 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 a gallon. Uh, it's because it's surely not going back down to 226 a gallon in 2016 in current dollars. Okay? That just is not going to happen. And, and I know I you don't want violent to, agreement that... Uh, uh, I know, but I wish that we could get some agreement in terms of how high then the fuel economy standard should go uh, in order to, uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, get that result. And by the way, your price projection per barrel of oil is higher than EIA is projecting, uh, $105 a barrel. They have it lower than that in the out years. Okay? So again, this is a big problem that we have in terms of what the Bush administration continues to propose in the long run uh, for what we have to do as a society in order to protect ourselves. My time has expired. Let me turn and recognize uh, the gentleman from uh, uh, Arizona, and I will be generous uh, to him in his time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Szymanski, I want to begin with you. I listened carefully to your testimony, um, and you stated that we are not running out of oil. Uh, you said that we need to look at what's out there and where, where the resource is on the acres that are available. Uh, and then you talked about the importance of being able to get to those resources. Uh, and you said that if the resource is on lands that are essentially locked up, those are the lands that need to be released. I take it then that you will believe that there are lands where we have locked up the supply and cannot get to them at the current time. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. You also said, and I, I thought it was important, uh, that uh, we may be uh, reaching a point where we have a problem getting to the acres where the supplies are. Are there some that you can identify? Uh, yes, sir. We know that there is natural gas off of the coast of Florida. It's already been discovered, and it's not being produced because of environmental concerns that seem to me to be uh, uh, overreacting. The last legislation that failed on that issue, if I'm correct, proposed that we would not allow a natural gas well to be closer than 50 miles from the shore. 
uh, and that was found to be objectionable because of site pollution. Uh, do you happen to believe that you can see 50 miles out uh, into the ocean and see an oil rig? Uh, it, it actually gets worse than that. Um, the Cuban government will be drilling closer to the shore of Florida than the United States will be drilling. So that's not an urban myth, that's a fact? That is a fact. Um, uh, there is concern about uh, environmental concerns, and I think every witness acknowledged those. I would certainly acknowledge those. Um, do you know uh, what happens at a, a natural gas rig where there is a, a leak, and have there been any leaks at natural gas uh, rigs recently? Well, this is the, one of the factors that pains me when I think about this, is uh, in talking with uh, a uh, county representative, elected county representative that I've been friends with for years uh, in the Tallahassee area, I said, can you convince your constituents to think about uh, looking at this gas field, you're going to need it in Florida. We have a power problem, as uh, Amy mentioned. Uh, we could very easily have electricity shortages uh, three, four, or five years from now. Uh, natural gas is going to be the only way to do that. Uh, natural gas is clean. If you do have a spill, it's not going to foul the beaches in, in Florida. The pipelines could come in underground. Nobody would see them. Uh, and yet, the reaction of his constituents seems to be that they're afraid it's going to hurt the tourism industry. And I. I'm frankly more concerned that the tourism industry will be hurt by brownouts in Florida Absolutely. than than it's going to be hurt by uh, drilling the gas that we know is already there. Ms. Harbart said that she thought that if we explored the Outer Continental Shelf when after the oil and natural gas there, we would have a supply of 35 additional years, I believe, just in natural gas. I'll ask her in just a moment. Do you agree with that the supplies are in that neighborhood? Uh, that we need to get from... That, that we could get from the Outer Continental Shelf. Yeah, I, you know, the, those numbers, uh, Guy Caruso will have, those are the people at okay. EIA, uh, but uh, it's, it's substantial. And let me just make one quick comment on that. Uh, the idea that it's only a small proportion of our energy needs when you look at it over an annual basis or over a period of time, I think is really uh, is missing the whole point. Uh, I get paid every two weeks, and, uh, and frankly, uh, I don't, you know, and one of my paychecks is only, uh, is a small proportion Got it. of my annual income, but I don't want to give up one of those paychecks, and sure. I don't think other people do. I'm running out of time. I want to get to Ms. Harbert. Uh, Ms. Harbert, uh, give me the statistic again, because sure. I'd like to know it. And I'll answer your other question. You can, the human eye can see 16 miles, so uh, that's how far you can Less see. than a third of what we're talking about. Right. Uh, according to the Minerals Management Service, we have 139 billion barrels of undiscovered oil reserves in this country. Of that 139, 86 are in the Outer Continental Shelf, which means that 62 percent of the nation's resources for oil are in the Outer Continental Shelf. And they are currently uh, prohibited 80 percent of that is off limits for exploration and production. And that's a. And that, I'm just talking about oil. I, the, we're, the other ones that you were talking about were gas, but that's that's just oil. That's just oil. That does not include natural gas. Do you have figures on natural gas? Uh, I can get those for the record. Okay. Um, uh, let's. Uh, so obviously we have a huge supply in the outer continental shelf, which we could be going after, uh, and and uh, increase our supply for a substantial period of time. But we have politically decided not to do that. Is that correct? That is correct, and our friendly neighbors uh, to the north and to south also have significant supplies to increase our North American energy security. And that's just, we're just talking about oil, there's natural gas on top of that? Yes. Okay, the numbers I have on natural gas show 287.82 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Uh, that's just in the lower uh, 48 in the outer, outer continental shelf. I want to switch to oil shale. Uh, the United States Congress, the House, just less than a year ago, put a moratorium on oil shale. Uh, the chairman mentioned that he thought the predicted supply of oil shale was in the neighborhood of one trillion barrels uh, of oil shale in place. Uh, I've heard a figure as high as 1.8 trillion. Can you tell us about the available oil we could get from oil shale? There's a tremendous potential in the Midwest, but unless we actually have an incentive out there for the, the companies that are out there to develop the technology to actually be able to produce this even more cleanly and better, without an opportunity to explore, there is no opportunity to develop the technology. There are several companies, including Shell, that are out there that have developed the technology to extract three times the size of Saudi Arabia's resources out of that area. But if you can't open it up, who's going to develop the technology, which is hugely expensive to do this in an environmentally sustainable way? We have got to incentivize 
our way out of this crisis, and not penalize and put things off limits. And currently that is a political decision. Again, we put a political moratorium on the production of oil shale. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Caruso, would you advise the next administration that if, as they set out to put together uh, their energy policy, whether it be uh, uh, Senator McCain or Senator Obama, would you recommend that they do that behind closed doors, uh, in secret, or do you think it should be a transparent, open uh, policy? Well, I'm head of a statistical agency and uh, we believe in transparency and openness, so I certainly uh, think that works best. Do you think that that in part and parcel is a problem with the American public when they, as everyone is working towards solutions, that when you do things behind closed doors in the dark of night, uh, that you, it seems to the American people, especially when you come from a background of oil yourself, that somehow, not you personally, but the Vice President, that somehow these uh, things aren't transparent? I'm, uh, I'm obviously not familiar with. Is there anyone in the, on the panel who doesn't believe that we shouldn't have a more open and transparent policy uh, with respect to our energy policy? I would just like to add to that that there is a tremendous amount of disinformation that goes out to the public on the factual, indisputable technicalities of oil and gas, and that uh, to the extent that people feel the need to fulfill what they think their constituencies want to hear, and they go on CNN and tell the public something that is factually incorrect, that makes the work of everybody on this panel ten times harder, because we have to spend a <coughs> tremendous amount of time publishing documents that put out factual things about what car technology is available, about how many lands are available for drilling. Well, we just it received makes it very some uh, very good testimony. I thank the panelists, et cetera, and uh, one of them in talking about this was going through the notion that you can't explain why oil, you know, uh, went up $11 a barrel. I think it was um, Herbert who said that. Are the laws of supply and demand suspended? And isn't it the fact that the dark markets have taken over in terms of speculation? Is speculation part and parcel of what's driving the cost of, of oil up artificially so that we can't, from a policy perspective, get our arms around this? If, if I could try a quick answer to that, um, the $11 move that we had last week, uh, two of the factors that played into that were, one, an uh, outage on a significant natural gas pipeline in Australia that has raised the demand for distillate fuels in that country <coughs> to keep their mines open, so the metals mine. Funny thing is, my constituents, when I go back home and talk to them, they say, how is it that something happens and then immediately the next day at the, the prices go up in gasoline or in any kind? And yet when things happen where they say dem demand is less and things are gone, the prices stay the same. They don't come down. Are the laws of supply and demand suspended? And are, is the industry at the whim of speculators, especially those that are unregulated and unseen, with the capability of driving the marketplace up artificially? Yes or no? Do you think that that's the case? Is that a problem or not? Yes, I think it's a problem. We're in a Good. bubble yes. mania. Yes. So in the what market? about you, Mr. Well, I don't think it's uh, one thing, probably. It's, I think speculation is a part of the problem. Uh, Inc increased demand is part of the problem, uh, the, the weak Sorry. dollar. Speculation have any role in this? We have a very, very tight market between supply and demand. And to the extent that our economy, the receding dollar, et cetera, are exacerbating that, should that we, if you uh, look should at... Should we regulate the dark market? If you look at speculation, it's adding volatility into the market, but it would do nothing to turn around and reduce and reverse the price increase. We want the transparency that everybody... We, we want the markets to clear and to function, because otherwise it will be even less orderly. And should we, we have look that in the into 70s. the dark markets? Well, what we need to should do... Should they be regulated? No. No, Should they, be they are regulated. We need Who? to look at... Who regulates the uh, over-the-counter market? The Commodities Futures Exchange. No, it doesn't. What we really need to do is think about how much speculation and what kind of speculation it is and what are the solutions. How can so you determine solution, that if they're unregulated? What do one, you think about that, Mr. Caruso? One solution might be Excuse me, to Mr. have Jeffy, margin requirements Mr. Caruso, that are my higher. time's running. What do you think about that? 
Should we be regulating these unregulated dark markets? I think we need more information from those markets to be able to understand. How do you what's get it if on. they're not regulated? Well, it, they may need to be. And the uh, CFTC, FTC, and Department of Justice uh, are meeting tomorrow in their first uh, task force meeting to look at that issue. After more than two and a half years of our pleading that they do so, but it still doesn't answer the question of the dark markets and their ability to be unregulated and to speculate uh, on what's happening and drive these costs up. People in my district call that economic terrorism and something we ought to be making sure that the Justice Department is involved in. And Mr. Larson, if I may, that just, all this stuff is just another reminder that we need to get off of oil. I mean, this stuff is, uh, you know, it's just not sustainable the way the, the markets are wor working or where it's located. We just need to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. I agree wholeheartedly, but in the, pro in the meantime, as my grandfather would say, trust everyone but cut the cards. We not only need to cut the cards, we need a new deal here. We also need to think more flexibly about how and when we use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and the IEA stockpiling system. This administration, unlike previous administrations, has said that the SPR is off the books except for national war emergencies. And we are not using a tool that we had that was used successfully by the Clinton administration to cap speculators out of the market. So we haven't looked at that. We haven't debated it. I would guess from my long experience and, and watching the way, uh, as, as uh, Adam put it, set market sentiment is determined, that if the markets felt that some uh, player with strategic stocks was going to come in and possibly make a release, they'd be a little less confident about buying the market long. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the hearing, and I think there's been some good information come out of it. Um, Mrs. Harbert, I, I especially appreciate your testimony. And uh, I, I keep hearing uh, from Mr. Manuel that we need to stop using oil, natural gas, and coal, I think he said, are, are sort of the evil energy sources of the United States, and that we need to wean ourselves off of those sources. My question for you and, and for Mr. Caruso is, what's the practicality of that? What do you replace them with? And how soon could you do that? No, I'm, I'm asking Mrs. Harbert. For the benefit of our economy and our national security, we want to reduce our dependence on any single fuel. In this right. case, it happens to be oil. We do need a diverse supply. However, it is unrealistic to think that we will not have hydrocarbons as a very large part of our future for the foreseeable future. And we need to figure out how to make that a stable, secure supply. We need to find new places where that exists. We want to have control over those, and they exist right here at home. And so we be, have to be able to use our oil, our gas, our coal responsibly. We have the technology to do that. All right. Mr. Uh, Mr. Siminski, we've heard a lot about the dark markets and the effect of speculators on price. About three years ago or so, I actually led an effort asking the Government Accountability Office to investigate those markets, and they produced a rather lengthy report and recommended some changes in, the, in those markets. And I think there's a certain element of speculation that drives up price, but I thought you made a pretty good point about why the speculators are in those markets. And does, it, it was what you were saying is that has a lot to do with the fact that we lock up most of our new resource or available resource in this country? Well, and I think that it's, it's just a global a, uh, market with, the, with increasing demand? It's a concern that uh, supplies are looking more and more limited and demand, at least outside of the United States so far, hasn't been reacting all that much to prices. So I think that we're involved in a very painful economic experiment to try to find out what price is required to get uh, supplies to rise and demand to go down. As far as the dark markets are concerned, let me make three comments. Uh, Guy attended a meeting at the Commodities Future Trading Commission yesterday. I uh, listened very carefully to the testimony there. The uh, CFTC is very concerned about uh, three major areas. The over-the-counter trading, right. uh, which doesn't have the same reporting requirements. Swaps right. dealers, where, where who is defined as speculators versus non-speculators are, are, are at issue. And foreign exchanges, where uh, some of the contracts traded on the NYMEX here in America right. are also traded overseas. Uh, the uh, staff at the CFTC has actually looked into a number of these things, and uh, so far, from the data that they have, they don't think that there are big issues there. Uh, I'm all in favor of switching the light on the dark markets. You bet. Uh, the people I work with on the trading desk are all in favor of transparency. I don't think there'll be a monster in the room when the light goes on. All right. Then, 
If, if that's the case, then it really does get back to supply and demand curve. Now, I, I don't know about anybody else. I, I drive a hybrid here and I drive a hybrid back in Oregon. I'm try, I've, I've increased my mileage by 60 percent in Oregon and doubled it here. Um, not everybody has the luxury of, of investing in a hybrid. I, I don't know how many of you shop at Walmart. I get in there about once a week back in my hometown. There are a lot of Walmart moms and a lot of diesel driving, truck driving dads. They're having a hell of a time making ends meet. And that's the case. And, and Mr. Manuel, I've, I've heard, you know, from the Sierra Club on this issue of no new drilling anywhere. It won't help us anyhow. And I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm coming down more on the side that says access to proven reserves in America creates American jobs, American energy, and it will have an effect on price over time. So I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with you, but it wouldn't be the first time because I know your, your group doesn't want us to cut any trees in the national forest either, so we let them burn. But that's another subject for another day. <laughs> Um, but but I, I want to get back to this issue, Mr. Siminski. If Congress were to act to open up the OCS or ANWR or shales or tar sands, if we were just to pass a law, knowing that it wouldn't, we wouldn't actually extract those resources for 10 or 20 years, do you think the simple act of Congress saying we've changed America's energy policy would have an effect on markets and speculators? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Uh, I think that, it, as I said it, during the course of my first remarks, it's the sentiment that matters. Right now, uh, everybody in the oil markets is making this assumption that demand isn't going to go down and supply okay. you know, is going to be fixed. Yes. If we can change that thinking, and changing that thinking would be, look, we're going to open up the Outer Continental Shelf, we're going to uh, start building nuclear power plants five a year for the next 20 years, and we're going to pass even stricter fuel efficiency right. standards on automobiles than we did before, and even do things like uh, the light bulbs. I mean, that's not the wrong thing to do. That's like one of the small steps we, did we have that. to take. We have to take I all of these it. small steps, yes. and we have to do it all at the same time. Yeah, it seems to me that the data show that Americans need to conserve, but even when we conserve at a rate greater than any time since World War II, reducing our, our consumption of, of oil and our driving, according to the statistics, I believe that's correct, it's not having the effect it used to have. Well, it, it other is beginning markets. to work here. I mean, uh, oh, it's killing the, us here. The statistics well, yeah. are that, that demand is down 4% on well, a year-over-year -year basis. Americans are buying smaller cars. They're driving hey, they're showing, models. They're, they're, not going to, they're not going to their kids' away games anymore because right. they can't afford the gas. They're it's showing painful. up at work <laughs> two hours early so they can carpool with their spouse. You know, they are, they're making tough decisions in their lives. And that's, you know, I want people to conserve, but I don't... Mr. Chairman, I, I, everybody's gone at least a minute and a half over. So <laughs> no, you're, you're at a minute and six right now, and I'm just. I'm, that, you were two twenty-three. I, I'm, at, um. I'm saying I, I did not say a word. I just tapped lightly <laughs> to give you a notice that you're 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 away. I'm worried time, about that other hand of yours, I did though, not, with that I did, club I did, thing I on it. Well, I would give my right arm <laughs> to be able to say what I really want to say right now, but but the. Um, but you're you're over, and I'm just tapping lightly. I'll 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 give up. No, I'm just. Well, I, I I was just I don't know where I was going with it. I'll I'll quit at that. If if everyone in the country telecommuted one day a week starting tomorrow, we would save 20 percent of our oil use. And and that's great, except I represent a district that's 70,000 square miles, where you got you don't pull a horse trailer with a Prius. I own a Prius. You can't drive a horse. Telecommute. In other words, you work what, from you, home. Uh, uh, ma'am, ma'am, you ever been on a cattle ranch? A lot of them work from home. You still got to haul the hay out to the field. You got to bring it back. You're on a wheat ranch. You still got to run the tractor. Fertilizer I'm costs of stuff. I'm just talking about commuters. I'm just talking about commuters. We're, we're, we're all representing people we represent. And I, I don't disagree, and I've supported telecommuting efforts and funding in my district. I think it's wonderful, but I'm saying there are a lot of other folks out there in real America that can't do that that can't do that. Their, their, their costs of commuting now are higher than their mortgage costs. And they lived in a different town because the housing costs were cheaper. These are real people going upside down in this country, and we don't want to do anything about it here, and that's wrong. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you. And uh, I, my, my friend, Mr. Walton, I think that we do want to do something about it. I, I certainly do, and I think all of us do here. And there's certainly areas, as the witnesses have reminded us, uh, of uh, agreement in areas of overlap, and uh, I think we should uh, work as fast and as hard as we can on those. 
Um, so uh, the EIA has run a lot of assessments about oil prices based on projected supply and demand along a base uh, case. And I'd just like to ask Mr. Caruso, uh, has EIA run any estimates incorporating an assumption that America's auto fleet will be significantly more efficient by 2030? We have in the um, latest outlook incorporated the, the new laws, so we have about a 40 percent increase in miles uh, per gallon in, in this uh, 2008 outlook. Uh, and we haven't uh, specifically run a scenario where we took a, a much lar a larger increase, but we have done uh, improved technology cases which try to simulate that. So there are, there are about 30 different cases in, in our long-term outlook that try to simulate different policy changes uh, and economic conditions. You know, oh, thank you very much. That's good. And I, I, I've noticed that every state that's had, for instance, a renewable energy standard, including Texas, where our president signed one uh, for 10 percent RES when, uh, as president of the United States, uh, as governor, I should say, governor of Texas, he signed one. As president, he's been unwilling to sign one for the whole country. But the state of Texas exceeded their 10 percent and has uh, eclipsed California now as the largest uh, installed wind capacity state in the country. Uh, so there is some evidence that when you put a goal out there, Americans exceed it, uh, be it with electricity or with uh, transportation uh, fuels or vehicles. Um, indeed, uh, the Chevy Volt I was just reading, uh, which will be coming out next year or the year after that, will basically have a, uh, it's an electric car that will have a uh, internal combustion engine for the purpose only of charging the batteries, the lithium-ion battery bank, uh, which will drive the vehicle. And they say on long-distance travel, uh, it's a commuter vehicle uh, which will run on electric for commuter distances 100 miles or less. On intercity or long-distance travel, it will average 150 miles per gallon uh, based on technology they have that they're bringing to market in the next couple of years. Toyota just announced, I think yesterday or the day before, a car that they are planning to release that will get 500 miles to the gallon. So I think we're going to see an exponential growth in efficiency as well as in uh, uh, substitute uh, uh, power for transportation, which is a good thing because we need the liquid fuels for air tra travel for uh, considerably longer time, I think, as we figure out how else we might be able to fly. Um, if the overall uh, market uh, was made up, say, 50 percent, 50 percent hybrids, can you theorize what that might do to consumption? Uh, not off the top of my head. I know our base case has um, 45 percent new car sales of alternatively fueled vehicles in 2030. But that is a ramp up. Right. So it takes a long time as you Point, as you alluded. People wear out their cars and it yeah. takes a while before they buy but a new car. certainly that calculation could be made if you would, I could supply that for the record. There was We've a, done the calculation that if starting in 2015 all new cars got 50 miles to the gallon, mm -hmm. it would save uh, 6.7 million barrels a day at the current rate of car turnover. Did you see the article, article I think it was uh, uh, in the New York Times, about the, the impact on different areas of the country? of fuel prices, uh, for instance, the southern uh, and more rural districts where trucks are uh, in heavier use and they tend to be old and very inefficient. Uh, as I, it had a map with different colors and showed, it was really interesting and it made me think that perhaps we should be trying to help those states and those districts where people have historically driven trucks for, for work and for transportation and are driving ones that get less than 10 miles per gallon and older models and can't afford to upgrade to a new hybrid truck that shuts down half the eight cylinders when it's on, you know, straight, a straightaway at a constant speed, uh, which are being made currently by GM and, and, and Ford uh, in this country. Um, anyway, I just wanted to make a, uh, a comment about substitutability, which I think you mentioned, uh, Ms. Jaffe. Uh, when I was in... Um, Israel, I was pleased to learn about a company there that's making uh, electric vehicles and uh, interchangeable batteries. And their concept is you pull into a service station and then rather than charging your battery, they just take one out and put another newly charged one in, hook up the wires and you drive away in a few seconds. 
as opposed to taking a few minutes to recharge or refill your tank with, with fuel. And uh, uh, wondering if anybody's considered this sort of thing, at least in commuter areas of the United States. Uh, one of the things I think the Israeli government uh, said when they announced that program was that uh, they really feel that they're sort of meeting global need, that they have a small country and it's easy for Israeli commuters to do that because they don't drive more than two hours, uh, you know, from one end of the country to the other three hours. But that would have applications in large cities. It would have a great application in Manhattan, great application in a place like Singapore, or even in some other larger U.S. cities where you have a very dense population uh, that has a limited uh, geographic area that they drive. Um, we actually did the calculation uh, back when gasoline prices were $3, that if today I could plug in my car, because I, I, in Houston I live what we call inside the loop, and I really never go more than 10 or 15 miles a day, uh, I could have spent two cents a mile if I could have plugged my car into my house and not bought gasoline versus, say, 17 cents a mile at that time. Uh, so there really is an advantage, and there is this advantage for us in terms of national security, if you can imagine our either getting cut off by the Middle East or having a major hurricane on the Gulf Coast that knocked out refining, and we suddenly had a, a, a temporary hiatus in the ability to have enough gasoline, if some Americans could plug in, I mean, th then some people would be able to drive without recourse to gasoline, then the need for rationing or the kinds of things we saw in 73 would be greatly eased. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the panelists for being here today. And when, when I look at the energy issues, I talk to people on this panel, other members of Congress on both sides. I think we all agree that when we look at some way, some comprehensive energy plan to reduce prices, to lessen the emissions in, this, in the world, uh, we, we, we have to look at it from a multi-pronged approach, many different approaches. It's not just one thing. And, you know, one, one of the things, we, we need to lessen our dependence on foreign oil. We need to maybe use less oil and gas. That's true. We need to look at alternative energy sources, wind, solar, nuclear. All those things are very, very important. I think a lot of people, Ms. Harbert even talked about that. Um, others have talked about that on this panel. You know, but... Right now, we are getting a lot of our, and, and, and the technolo technological advances aren't in place right now where we can just shoot the horse on gas and oil right now and jump on another horse right now. And, and so I, I guess I'll ask Mr. Manuel, you know, you said that one of the things you said that really disturbed me that I think was less than truthful is that we don't have any gas and oil here to, to explore here in the United States. You said that. And I, I can tell you right now, I got a thing here and I'll give it to you, but we've got just in the offshore, in, in Pacific offshore, we got 10 billion barrels of oil we could, could get here in our own backyard. We also got 18 trillion cubic feet of gas that's in the Pacific. Uh, offshore Alaska, we've got 27 billion barrels of oil that we could get, and we got 132 trillion cubic feet of gas. Uh, on the Atlantic offshore, we got 4 billion barrels of oil and 37 trillion cubic feet of gas. Uh, offshore Gulf, we've got deep water, four, 45 billion barrels of oil, 233 trillion cubic feet of gas. And the lower 48 inaccessible, and these are inaccessible, government says it's against the law to do, um, we have 20 billion uh, barrels of oil in the lower 48 onshore and 162 trillion cubic feet of gas. And what I'm saying is until we develop the technologies that we can do other things, why do you think it's so wrong to get some in our own backyard? You think you prefer that we go to the Mideast to get it or outside this country. Why is it so wrong to get it here while we are developing those technologies so we can get prices down? Well, just to point out, I, did, I said that the U.S. has about 2 to 3 percent of the world's proven oil reserves. I didn't say we had uh, none. And on, on the contrary, I, I pointed out that we've opened up, at, we've opened up thousands and thousands of millions of acres to new oil and gas drilling in the last 30, 35 years. 
And if you look at just this past year, we've had two huge, the Minerals Management Services had two very large lease sales, one in the Chukchi Sea, one in the central Gulf of Mexico. So there's not a question of access. We have all these uh, uh, leases that have been sold to oil and gas companies that aren't being used. Both these are off limits, what I just said. They're off limits. No, I know, but, there's, but, but the point is the stuff that's open now is not being utilized. And, and we don't think, and, we, and again, if you look at the MMS figures, we think that 80 percent of the resources that are available offshore are in areas that are already opened. Most of the oil and gas found in the United States is, is, is in the central and western Gulf of Mexico. That's where the companies want to go. Those, that area has been open for 20, do you, 30 years. Do you see anything wrong with going in these areas that I mentioned? Well, I do. I don't think we should open up any new areas for new offshore drilling. So you don't think it's a good idea to get more at home in our own backyard? We don't, think think it'll do it any, we don't think it'll make any difference on the price of a gallon of gas. Because, again, we've tried that. D the lease sale that happened in the Chukchi, did, that didn't le drop the price of a gallon of oh. gas. When well. we opened the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System in 1975, Three years later, the Shah of Iran fell and Iranian oil became off the market. Our prices went sky high, even though we had opened up the largest oil field in the United States. There's no historical data to show that opening up individual fields in the United States has had any impact on the price of gas. You, you wouldn't agree United that States? this is part of the puzzle, though, when we look at uh, multiple well, uh, uh, issues that we have to look at to address our energy issue? You don't think this is part of the puzzle? to address that as we develop the technologies where we can move to other types of energy, you don't think that we should do that? Well, we acknowledge that it's going to take us a while to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, but there's plenty of areas that are opened right now that allow us to do that. that we, it's and, not adequate. Well, we think that's the way to go for a variety of reasons, environmental damage to these well, areas, but also the global warming, greenhouse gas emissions. We think the better path for our country is a future of clean energy sources, renewables, energy efficiency, it, fuel economy. That would save more oil and gas than thought to be off of these areas. Is that, is that the mission of the Sierra Club to, to lessen our dependence on, on oil and our coal and, and also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? That's your primary purpose? Our goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions okay. and wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. Okay. Do you support nuclear power? No, we don't right now because of the subject. That has no emissions. Do you know that? Well, it's got a lot of nuclear waste, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And, and you, you, so you don't support nuclear power at all? No, we don't. Not, it's did, a, did a former member of your group I read support, does now supports the use of nuclear power? Pardon me? Former. Did someone in your organization that was in your organization that's not in your organization now support nuclear Well, I can't comment for former members of the Sierra Club. Well, he does. Um, do, you, do you think, Ms. Halbert, could you, could you tell us, um, what, again, just very quickly, what do you think we should do? I mean, we, we, have, uh, we, we need to look at this in a, in a, from a multiple approaches. Uh, we are going to try to wean ourselves off gas and oil. We probably will move towards that direction with technology, as technology develops. But what do you think we should do in the meantime? We need to responsibly exploit the resources we have here at home, you know, play the home team, play to our advantages. We need, are investing now, right now, less in research and development than we did after the Arab oil embargo. We have to get serious and invest in advanced technologies. We have to streamline permitting for energy infrastructure, and that includes new nuclear plants so that it's emissions free and we've got secure, available, local supplies of nuclear energy. Well, do you believe that what uh, Mr. Man Manuel said about the uh, we already have enough going on. The, what I mentioned earlier is not we don't even need to go into this because we have plenty already here in the United States to address this and that while we are in this gap looking for... Well, energy demand demands. is forecasted to go up by 30 percent in this country. We don't have the same amount of growth in production planned for this country. So there is a growing gap between supply and demand that has to be met somehow. Okay. Uh, also on the markets, you mentioned uh, the speculation and all of that. Um, there may or may not be some in the price of crude. That probably is a little bit. If you did regulate here, and we do to a certain extent some of the markets, um, what would keep them from, you know, traders just trading in another country? Yeah. You, well, I gentleman can answer the question. I think that uh, that we need to do what we can do in our own markets and in, with the foreign uh, agencies that we can work with, like in London and in Dubai, where there are actually initiatives underway to uh, cast some light on the dark market question. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, this, there's been some very interesting testimony today, some of it very specific, some of it very general, uh, and uh, I think it illuminates the issue uh, quite a bit. Uh, one of the um, things that I hear are, are there's two real salient points. First of all, we need to work on a bipartisan basis to find reasonable solutions that will make our, our energy stable, uh, our energy future stable. I think everybody agrees with that. Uh, 
The other one is that we need to encourage innovation to develop a stable and reliable energy future. Personally, I believe that energy efficiency is our best resource, and there was some very impressive testimony. For example, Mr. Caruso said that uh, our current uh, CAFE standard of 35 miles per gallon will save 2 million barrels a day. Uh, and Ms. Jaffe said that, that 50 miles per gallon will save 6.7 million barrels a day. What I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Caruso, how much do you think that would affect our price of gas at the pump if we save $2 million, uh, two million barrels a day? Well, we, we think that, um, as uh, the chairman mentioned, that if we can bring consumption down, in this case, two million barrels a day, and increase uh, supplies, that uh, we can see the, the real price of oil go down, the, the prices that chairman was quoting are in 2006. Well, how much dollars. do you think that would affect the price at the pump today if we were saving two billion, two million barrels a day? Uh, I don't have that number right off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to provide that. It certainly would uh, put downward pressure on price. Do you have a, an estimate, Ms. Jaffe? Or, I guess. Uh, some of it gets to the issue uh, that Adam brought up, which is the sort of uh, what's driving the speculative fervor. So I will say, just factually. Uh, U.S. demand for oil is down 4 percent this year versus last year. And part of what you're trying to do is create an atmosphere where people see that as a long-term trend line and they start to trade oil with that mentality in mind. Do you think uh, 6.7 million barrel per day savings in, oil, in our oil consumption would lower the price of gas substantially? Yes, I think it would make a substantial lowering in the price. You know. Um, you mentioned a couple of things also that I think were interesting. Uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, uh, using that to reduce the speculation in the market. Uh, do you have a, a specific proposal and how effective do you think that would be? Well, um, uh, let me give you a specific example. There was a period of time, and I can't remember what the risk factor was in the market, but uh, when uh, uh, Secretary Richardson did a quote unquote test sale. Uh, of the SPR. And, um, and the effect it had at the time, because prices were sort of creeping above $40 a barrel, and it, it spooked people in the market briefly, uh, and prices went back down into the 30s. What happened then is every time the price would subsequently get to $39 or something like that, people would automatically naturally assume that the SPR might be released again, and so they would take their profits at a certain number. So this is a very effective tool that's in the hands of the administration that's not being used. In fact, it's, it's, it's being forbidden from being used. It's been taken off the table by the administration. By taking it off the table, the administration has not only meant that you could trade up with impunity, it's also discouraged OPEC. Because if you're OPEC and you know that we might use strategic stocks, then it behooves you to raise your production because you might as well get the money. Whereas if we release the SPR, you know, the Treasury gets the money. So it's had a negative effect, in my opinion, on both the dynamic of having OPEC respond the way they did, say, in 90 by increasing their output, and it's had a negative dynamic on the sort of way speculators feel about the upside of the market. I think you might want to be very careful about using the Strategic Petroleum Reserve just solely looking at the price alone. Uh, the obvious. Uh, exceptions to using the strategic petroleum reserve that the administration did not use was the strike in Venezuela. If you actually have a shortage of oil caused by something like a strike or an accident or weather, uh, using the SPR at that time, and not only ours, but the product inventories in Europe makes a lot of sense. Doing it for price alone, I think, takes you down a path that you might not want to go. I would agree with that, but I'd like to add to that something. When we had Hurricane Rita Katrina, another time the administration, you know, didn't really, you know, strongly use the SPR. The point is we had to borrow gasoline from European strategic stocks of gasoline. And if, if the outage had lasted longer, they were not going to lend to us a second time. We do not require oil companies in this country to carry a minimum inventory. That is required in Asia and that is required in Europe. Had we have that requirement, 
then the buildup in prices we get every spring would be less likely to happen. Part of what causes the speculative run-up in gasoline prices in the spring is we need to attract imports because we can't manufacture to meet demand. When the companies don't carry inventory, if we have an accident like the Venezuelan strike that accidentally lowers inventories, we never catch up and that's reflected immediately in the pump price. Now, another thing you discussed, uh, I, I like the idea, was sub substitutability. You compared the electricity market to the transportation market, but uh, the way you envision substitutability applying in the transportation market, what would be the carbon footprint impact of that uh, as com compared to the current um, supply for the transportation market? This is what we need to think through. We, we know that there's a problem in the power generation sector because we're so heavily reliant on coal, but we need to have what I call an infrastructure paradigm shift. So over time, if we bring cars that have substitutability, so we bring some cars that can work off electricity, right now uh, we have different things. Some things in the supply stack for electricity are clean and some things aren't. But if then over time we can move our policies so that we move to things like more distributed energy, like say we all had more, a better technology for solar rooftops, then you could plug in your car and it would be in California, I'd be plugging it in to, to solar. Right? So we would have a transition where we can marry the two things together. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandlin. I thank the Chairman, and I'm indebted to the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee, for allowing me to take this uh, set of questions now. Let me begin by saying that I agree uh, with Mr. Sullivan that parts of the area of the map that he showed us uh, that are currently inaccessible are a piece of the puzzle. And I hope that he agrees with me that biofuels production is also a piece of the puzzle. And so I would like to explore uh, with Administrator Caruso the issue of biofuels production and the testimony that we, re we received on April 1st of this year from uh, executives of the big five oil companies. Uh, four of them, four of the five that testified, acknowledged that increased biofuels production has reduced oil and gasoline prices, although they didn't agree with the magnitude. Um, the analysis that I raised with them that I want to raise with you now comes from a March 24th article in the Wall Street Journal reported uh, that Francisco Blanche, an analyst at Merrill Lynch, has concluded that oil and gasoline prices would be 15 percent higher but for the expanded production of biofuels. So my question, Mr. Caruso, is has the EIA calculated the degree to which increased biofuels production has lowered oil and gasoline prices in the United States? We haven't done the uh, similar analysis as you just referred to, but we did look at the 08 increment of biofuels uh, compared with 07, and looked at what would that, what that may, have, what impact that may have had on uh, gasoline prices, and our conclusion was uh, somewhere I think in the 10 to 15 cents per gallon uh, reduction in the price of gasoline direct that we believe can be attributed to the incremental production of uh, corn ethanol. For, uh, so a reduction for, for from where it might otherwise be in that one year period. Yes. Yes. Um, do you have any plans to perform a broader analysis? Uh, not at this time. But we, and we, why is that? Uh, we haven't been asked to. We don't. It, we try to uh, use our resources as best we can. Well, um, I would look forward to talking with the chairman at greater length about uh, formal request in light of some of the analysis that we think currently exists that the EIA could uh, supplement as it relates to the positive impact of increased biofuels. Now, you did say that um, in your testimony, uh, what are the key reasons for your testimony that while, quote, very uncertain, unquote, you conclude that Available quantities of cellulosic biofuels prior to 2022 will be insufficient to meet the new RFS targets for cellulosic biofuels, triggering both waivers and a modification of applicable volumes such that the overall RFS target in 2022 will be reduced from 36 billion to 32.5 billion gallons. Um, what are the key reasons for that testimony and what level of confidence does EIA have in an analysis that's explicitly very uncertain? Well, I, I would agree that we should start off by the how much uncertainty there is about that technology, and that's one of the reasons we make that statement. And we oh, so we, you're referring to the technology that exists? Yes, technology not, and cost. 
the, the two, of course, are interrelated. And we've worked with the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden to come up with what they think the best uh, outcome is likely to be. So if they're as of, as of uh, when that, when that uh, annual energy outlook was produced Which earlier was this year. Which was early this year. So yeah, uh, in light that's of our best judgment. the investments and the advancements um, that I see uh, in the advanced biofuels, cellulosic ethanol uh, industry, uh, if within the next year to 18 months it's demonstrated that the technological advancements are much further along than when you produce this study, that would be a factor that then would lead you to the, to the conclusion that production of cellulosic biofuels will indeed meet the RFS? Oh, definitely. We, we reevaluate our uh, assumptions every year, and I think uh, Congressman in Inslee, in his opening remarks, mentioned a few of these areas where okay. very significant changes can take place. So would you be willing to provide the committee the full analytical basis for the testimony regarding the RFS as of today and the report that was issued earlier? Certainly. Okay. We, we publish that every year. Okay. Uh, one last uh, area to explore. Uh, Ms. Jaffe, I agree with you on uh, this administration's inflexibility as it relates to using the SPR in a more strategic manner. Um, I met with uh, propane marketers from South Dakota yesterday. Uh, you know, the hedging tools that they typically use simply aren't an option for them anymore. Um, and I, I know that in addition to uh, utilizing the SPR more strategically, they actually called for higher margin requirements. And some of the other commodity uh, folks that I represent, farmers, ranchers, grain elevators, they actually have uh, proposed um, the idea of making the traders take, a take delivery of a percentage of the commodity that, the, that they're trading. Could you comment on either of those options? Yeah, I think that it's important to have financial clearing for the futures market for oil. I mean, the whole purpose of having a futures market for oil is to have a smooth and transparent way uh, that buyers and sellers can meet and have transparent and open pricing. Uh, in 70, 1979, you had to know Mark Rich to be able to figure out if you could or couldn't get oil on the spot market and what price he was selling it at. We don't want to go back to that. So, uh, so speculators do play a, a constructive role. Uh, uh, academics have done studies that show that having a functioning futures market actually lowers volatility, not the other way around. But uh, within that spectrum, um, we're in a very unusual market today where people's perceptions about the dollar, uh, the rising price of oil has become sort of a circular self-fulfilling motion. Uh, where we're getting to the point where the dangers of, of, of an overinflated bubble in, in these uh, facilities are a much larger danger to the average American than a normal market. Uh, and so under those situations, uh, it is important to have our regulatory bodies looking at it. Uh, and if it's just a mania, right, which, you know, we've had in other markets, it's just a mania. People just believe it's going to go higher, so it does go higher. Uh, we still want to think about things we can do to slow that down, and one option is to tighten the amount of, of contracts you can buy on margin. Great. General ladies, time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Listening to the panel, I think there are, very, uh, there are two truths I'd like to talk about, one short term and one long term to help our people who are taking it in the chops with $4 a gal gallon gas. First, on the short term, it's clear that we've seen this movie before. It was the Enron debacle, and we lived through it with 1,000 percent price hikes in 30 days with electricity because the market was broken. And it is clear that the market is broken now. And you know, you have you just listen to some unlikely sources. A uh, quote from um, uh, Iyad Madani, Saudi Arabia's info, uh, info and cultural minister, who says, quote, there is no justification for the current rise in prices. Others calling the surge in crude unjustified. Uh, Saudi oil chief Ali Nami says, quote, it is linked to tremendous speculation in crude oil futures, quote. You know, when you get um, Andy Pettit and Jose Canseco telling you got a steroids problem in baseball, you probably do. And when you get the Saudis telling you they got a broken market uh, in, based on speculation, you probably got a problem. And that's why we have to get these dark markets regulated. 
It's very disappointed the administration has refused to do so, and I look forward to the passage of Bart Stupak's bill that I'm helping him on to, in fact, bring into the regulatory destruction these speculative markets. We have seen this movie before. Now, that's the short term, but I want to ask Mr. Crusoe about the long term, because the long term, it is clear to me that we have to decarbonize our transportation sector largely as soon as possible or we're going to be stuck with these prices for a long, long time. And when I think about the predictions of the future, uh, Mr. Crusoe, you told us about some predictions. Um, what, do you, what, what, what is the assumption we have of, of the percentage of our private cars that can be either electrified or based largely on domestically produced substitute fuels in the next 20 years? What prediction does the agency make? Our current assumption on uh, alternatively fueled motor uh, light duty vehicles is uh, 45 percent of the new car sales in 2030 would be what we call alternatively fueled vehicles. That's hybrids. It also includes turbo diesels and flexible fuel vehicles, or E85 mainly. So those are the three. Now, the point you made earlier about plug-in hybrids, that as of now, as you alluded to, the, that technology is still not commercial. Let me, let me suggest so that, was, that we have very few plug-in hybrids in that outlook. I think that prediction can be hugely expanded if Congress will act. You know, we got to the moon in 10 years. In 10 years, this country got to the moon. Right now, our policy is not even get to Cleveland. We got to have a more aggressive policy, and I think we, we need to be much more optimistic. You know, we went from making 3,000 planes in 1939, and then we made 300,000 airplanes in the next four years in World War II. And we have to have a similar ramp up of ambition. Uh, a paper came up by a professor at Stanford just a couple weeks ago, Mark Jacobson. He's a professor of energy resources at Stanford. He said that using today's technology, Today's technologies, without technological advances, if we built about 100,000 wind turbines of 126 diameter um, uh, blade length, we could power our entire transportation fleet with electricity using today's technology. Now, the reason I point this out is, you know, 100,000 wind turbines sounds like a lot, right? But in four years, we built 300,000 airplanes because we had to do it. And I think that all of us need to raise the level of our ambition from that 45 percent to a much higher number much more quickly. And I believe the technology is there to do it. By 2011, we're going to have plug-in hybrid cars mass produced in the United States, something no one would have predicted five years ago. The lithium-ion batteries are making huge strides forward. We have potential commercialization of something that can be 50 times more productive than corn-based ethanol with algae-based gasoline and even biodiesel taking place. And I just point out that I just believe that the only way to tell Americans that their prices are going to come down long term is that if all of us become much more ambitions, ambitious on this technology there are. I know we can do it. We did it in space. We did it in World War II. We've got to raise our eye, uh, eyes. Do you have any, make any comments on Mr. Crusoe? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think the, it's clear. I'm, I, th I think almost everyone agrees on the the solution lies with improved technology and innovation and dedication to it. Right. And that includes R and D spending. Right. And the problem is we're not doing it. We spend one third as much in R and D in the entire national federal government as Microsoft does in research. Our energy budget in R&D is one-third Microsoft, one company's budget for R&D. We have no cap-and-trade system to create a demand, and unfortunately, the President Bush has been against it. We have no renewable portfolio standard. We have no feed-in tariff. We have no building standards. Congress and the next President of the United States w has to, and I believe will, set us on the course for a clean energy revolution. And uh, I'm looking forward to that on January 20th, 2009, starting that. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do any of you know where we got this, this, these new contraptions, the, the cell phone, what, what, what created this? Uh-huh, good. Um, I'll tell you. St 
Star Wars. And uh, way before most of you are too young uh, to, to uh, remember Star Trek, but, but you know, the captain would, would always flip out his phone. Anyway, that gave, uh, that gave uh, engineers the opportunity to do this. So Star Trek. OK, Mr. Spock. I'm obsessed with, um, with um, horror movies, and um, probably because the, the, the monsters are rarely after black people. But uh, I, you know, I watch this stuff and try not to and try not to become paranoid um, or join any cult. Uh, but. Uh, I, what I'm wondering from all of you, and I just have one question. Uh, we, we had this crisis occur uh, first during my lifetime in 1973, or, or, or close. That, uh, that was generated, I think, historians will say, was generated by OPEC. OK. OK. And then we had another in 1979. Um, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, in Iran. Um, and here we are again in 2008. Uh, the, the difference may be that in the first, during the first two, it, it was not, I mean, we, we really had not hit the oil peak. There are some who believe that uh, the movie that, that I just saw about three weeks ago, uh, when the world ran out of gas, uh, and, and it showed the cataclysmic impact of what happened, food crises, people standing in line. I mean, you've seen these, these, uh, 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 these futuristic movies, I mean, begging. Well, that's happening all over the world right now. In Ethiopia, in particular, people are dying, not to mention what's going on uh, uh, in the Sudan. But people are, the food prices are, are, have caused a worldwide panic. You know, all this is depicted in a movie. Uh, but we know that oil is finite. And, and there are some, including some big names in the oil industry, uh, who believe that, that we hit a, an oil peak and that we're actually uh, having a crisis that, that is not like the first two, that this one won't go away. This is going to be a problem until we, un, until we deplete the, the, uh, uh, the, the supply of fossil fuel deposited in the earth. Um, is, is, that, is that science fiction, or uh, have we again hit reality through the science fiction? Is it, we, we don't even have to go there, because we know we have global warming, and we know we have to take carbon out of our fuel system. And because we know that, it makes it different anyway, right? The way we would handle, let's say we have a recession and we have a global recession and demand for oil goes down, the price will come down, right? I mean, that is one scenario that could happen, right? Yeah. And uh, I know there are a lot of people who feel that won't happen again, but that does not change the reality that the, you know, oil reserves are finite at some point, and it doesn't change the reality that a lot of the oil we have left to produce is in places like Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. Right? But the bottom line is we know that we want to decarbonize our economy over time. We know that. And since we know that, uh, a lot of the same solutions, energy efficiency, right, um, um, uh, uh, alternative energy, R&D, some of those solutions are the same. So it really doesn't matter whether uh, 73, it's exactly the same or it's not exactly the same. The reason that it's different is we know we have to do something for a variety of reasons, not just national security, but even environmental reasons. We know we have to do something different. And we know that the lead time on scale up is decades, not months. And so that's why we have to start now. Mr. Cleaver, you're absolutely right. We have seen this movie before. We saw it in 1973, 74, and again in 1978 or 79 and 80. Uh, the kinds of solutions that I think that, that made it work out the last time were encouraging energy efficiency across all the sectors, encouraging fuel diversity, 
uh, encouraging trade and investment, R&D, and, and especially what we need to do this time, I think, is enhance our science and engineering capabilities so that the technology will come out to take care of some of these problems. I really don't think it's speculators that are driving up the oil price. I think it's an actual fear of uh, shortfalls in the coming years, and we need to take steps now to turn that psychology around. I think we can. This, this is not a horror movie with a bad ending. It's got a good ending. We just need to move along. Anyone else? Well, I agree generally that we, we need to uh, do as my, my colleagues have just said, that we need to innovate our way out of this. We need to start transitioning away from fossil fuels so that it's not a horror movie, that, um, that, that it's, and, and the technology is available now. Mr. Inslee was talking about some of these things, uh, windmills, fuel-efficient cars, plug-in hybrids, all that stuff is available now. We just have to aggressively move towards and start that transition. I know my time is running out. I, 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 I'm, I apologize for being late. I, I'm on the financial services. We're holding a hearing today on whether or not Congress should uh, enact legislation that would require HUD to uh, construct uh, energy efficient public housing units. Uh, and we're in a battle because somebody, uh, some, some folk don't, don't think that's the direction we ought to go. And it's just amazing I, 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 that if somebody took footage of our hearing, they could use it in a futuristic movie. Uh, using, I mean, listening to all the people give reasons why we shouldn't do this. And so my, my uh, concern is, is actually uh, heightened uh, by the, the fact that people are not taking this seriously. And, uh, you know, th this administration is just acting as if, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, all we need is an oil change. I'll agree with your analogy. Gentleman's time has, gentleman's time has expired. Um, the gentleman from uh, Oklahoma, seek recognition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to ask that uh, testimony submitted by uh, Carl Michael Smith, Executive Director of the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact, be uh, entered into the record. It would, that, that, uh, uh, Asking that, consent. It would, without objection, that document will be included at the appropriate place in the thank record. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Um, so um, all time for questions uh, by the select committee has been completed. So now we're going to turn to the panel. We're going to ask each one of you to give us your best one minute to tell us what you think we should know at this time in the history of the United States relationship uh, with oil and other uh, energy uh, sources. Uh, and we're going to go in reverse order of our original uh, testimony. So we'll begin with you, Ms. Harvard, your best one minute, if you would. Congratulations on this hearing. We need more deliberate discussions on this very complex issue. It's important to recognize there's no single solution. There's no short-term fix. There's no panacea. So we, in partnership with the American people, have to address this in a very comprehensive way, in a very urgent manner. We need short-term, medium-term, and long-term view on this. We have to remove restrictions on our resources here at home. We have to get serious about investing in our research and development. We have to invest in the next, the next generation of leaders, scientists, engineers, so that we can continue to have that intellectual feedstock that we need to sustain our competitiveness over the long term. We actually have to make available the fiscal resources so that we actually incentivize the investments to be made in this country rather than in other countries. We need to open up ourselves for that investment and innovation in this country that we're not doing. We have to make sure that we have predictability, regulatory predictability, that we have fiscal predictability so that the business community can make long-term capital investments in these very complex capital-intensive projects in this country. I'm an optimist. We have a lot of venture capital money going into this. We need to sustain that so we can actually win this very, very big challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hubbard. Uh, Mr. Manuel. Well, I'll, I'll take off on the optimism point. I think uh, I'm optimistic as well, as long as this, but we do urge this Congress to really lead America towards a clean energy future by continuing to push energy efficiency programs, renewable energy, clean energy programs, and fuel economy, because we think ultimately that's the way the country really has, needs to go and do so quickly. Uh, we didn't learn our lesson from the past. We, we continue to think we could drill our way out of the problem, and we just encourage Congress to lead us into the opposite direction, more toward, that's more sustainable, that's cleaner for our environment, stops clean, uh, redu uh, reverses global warming, stops greenhouse gas emissions, and puts America to work in a clean energy economy that's good for our environment and good for the country and good for the planet. Thank you, Mr. Manuel, very much. Uh, so uh, my one-minute message is that foreign oil producers and countries that, whose interests are not the same as the United States are exploiting our lack of political will 
uh, to gain power at the expense of U.S. national security and our flexibility in international relations. Uh, we, there are many short-term things we can do. The Senate has addressed some of those things, but when push comes to shove, given the challenges that are facing us both in energy and climate, uh, we need a serious research and development program in this country, both in private industry and in government. Uh, we need to not only think about how we tax corporations to get them to spend more on R&D, we need to be thinking about how we raise public funds to spend more on R&D. And let me just end with an optimistic note. I work with 81 nanotechnologists. They're working on solar energy. They're working on better transmission systems. They're working on uh, wind power, all kinds of very interesting technologies that, that I, I agree. Had we said we were going to the moon, but only put in $100 million to spend to do that, we would never have got there. And so we need to think about how we're going to come up with the money to do the kind of R&D we need. We have the people and we have the will. Uh, thank you. I, we thank you very much. And we know you're from Rice University in Houston. And in the same way that uh, we want you to say, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, uh, and that was the space program. I think we can say the same thing now about our energy program. We thank you for being here. Mr. Uh, Mr. Szymanski. Thank you. Uh, just two points. Uh, there have been tons of research done and investigations already underway that have shown that the futures markets are not being manipulated. And uh, so what I would suggest uh, as a first recommendation is that we uh, be very careful about uh, taking steps immediately to curtail uh, trading activity when what we really need is to cast light on the so-called dark market. So let's get the information first and then act rather than the other way around. Second point uh, is I, I really feel that direct controls on prices or profits are going to give you the wrong answers to the crisis that we're facing now. Uh, unfortunately and painfully, the high prices are actually what's encouraging uh, solar and wind and alternatives in the automobile industry and elsewhere uh, in biofuels, both cellulosic and everything else. So uh, let's, let's bear the pain for a bit and, and see if we can't let these alternatives uh, come, come out because of that. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Caruso. This is a, a problem that was, has been created in some ways by a good news, and that is global economic growth has been very strong. We need to sustain that growth by meeting these needs through using energy more efficiently, definitely, more economic, environmentally, consciously, but also to develop all forms of energy resources. There's no single solution, as a number of our panelists have said. So we need to facilitate investment in all forms of energy and research development and innovation, as has been mentioned. And this is a, not a short-term solution. We need to recognize this large-scale, long-term solution, and it's going to take time. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Caruso, uh, very much. And we thank uh, each of our witnesses. Uh, this is a very important hearing. It's a very timely hearing um, because it really goes to the question of where are we today? And what do we have to do in order to uh, avoid the most catastrophic consequences uh, of this huge amount of high-priced uh, oil that we are importing from around the world? Uh, if we do not have a plan, then clearly there is going to be uh, an, incre an incredible price that our economy is going to have to pay. Uh, so whether we're talking about using the Strategic Petroleum Reserve as a weapon uh, against the speculators, against the manipulators, we have to do that. And President Bush has refused to do that. Um, whether it's ensuring that the, uh, uh, that the CFTC, the Commodities Futures uh, Trading Commission, looks in at these dark markets, finds out what's going on with regard to the speculators, with regard to the manipulators, we have to do that. But the Bush administration thus far has kept hands off uh, this very critical part of uh, this story and the impact that it's having upon uh, these price uh, increases. And going forward, uh, long term, we have to have accurate projections uh, because much of what goes on inside the federal government, much, much of what uh, happens 
uh, in the private sector is dependent upon uh, the long-term projections of the Bush administration at this time and its Energy Information Administration. What we're seeing over uh, the last uh, five or six years is that there's basically been about a 50 cent lag between what the administration says the price of gasoline is going to be and then what it winds up being in year after year. And that has a tremendous impact ultimately upon consumers, but upon what the uh, mandates that we would then impose upon especially the automotive industry to increase their fuel economy standards. We again put 70 percent of all the oil we consume in America into gasoline tanks and we only have 2 percent of the oil in the world. That's our weakness. Now our strength is technology and that's the weakness of the Middle East. That's their weakness. So if we don't use our technology based upon what is a realistic assessment of what the long-term price of oil is going to be, then we are ultimately uh, going to be subservient uh, to the geopolitical whims of the Middle East. And by the way, when President Bush went to uh, Saudi Arabia uh, just three weeks ago and asked them to produce more oil that we could consume in the United States, that's a pretty sad moment in our history. But what was even sadder is that after uh, the Saudi Arabians said that they would not produce more oil, they then asked us to provide them with nuclear power plants uh, for Saudi Arabia and Condoleezza Rice and President Bush said yes to that request. Now, of all the countries in the world that need nuclear power and all of the nuclear equipment, the materials that go with it, Saudi Arabia is at the bottom of that list. They have more oil, more gas, more solar, more wind in combination than any other country in the world. They, and they have a very small population. Why would the Bush administration be, be uh, agreeing to a deal that will have us sell nuclear power plants into Saudi Arabia, when Iran, Iraq, North Korea, and all those nuclear power plants and their dual use purpose for nuclear bomb programs continue to haunt us? That's a sad state of affairs for us. It's a very sad state of affairs and very dangerous. It will get us even more deeply in trouble in the Middle East 10 years and 20 years from now. And so it's time for the Bush administration uh, to get more realistic. Uh, the Energy Administration, administration, the Department of Energy, that is, the Bush administration, is, project, is projecting $2.26 uh, a gallon gasoline by 2016. No, $2.51 a gallon gasoline by 2030. It's completely unrealistic. It's as, it's as off the mark, off the point as every other projection that's been made in this decade. And it, as a result, will diminish our ability to improve our technologies so that we can tell the Middle East that we don't need their oil any more than we need their sand. And right now, we still cannot deliver that message because we're operating in a delusory um, in, uh, uh, environment uh, where the Bush administration is not getting real with what is happening. This is no longer uh, the OPEC people deliberately saying no more oil. It's no longer the Shah of Iran falling. This is now structurally the Indians, the Chinese and others who are going to consume more oil as each year goes by and we have to change the technologies, our relationship to technology in our country. And because of the Bush administration, the, uh, the agency responsible for determining how efficient our automobiles have to be in 2015, 2020, and 2030, they're going, to have, they're going to be able to set standards that are five, six, seven miles per gallon lower than where they should be. By the way, the legislation which we passed in December, the Democrats in the first year after we came back into power, the increases from 25 to 35 miles per gallon uh, the um, fuel economy of, uh, of the vehicles which we drive uh, by 2020, that backs out the equivalent of all of the oil which we import on a daily basis from the Persian Gulf. That's the difference a change in technology can make. But you've got to have realistic data because now the Bush administration's Department of Transportation is going to implement the standards that are put in place pursuant to that law which we passed in December. And so all of this is interrelated, no question about it. But when you're talking about oil, you're talking about transportation. You're talking because that's where we put it. And this is, again, very central 
uh, to uh, the dilemma which we have. The Democrats came back in after being out for 12 years. It's the first thing we did. But the Bush administration had plenty of opportunity in their first six years to put those standards on the books. The Republican Congress had every opportunity to improve the fuel economy standards of our vehicles. They never did it. And so as we go forward, uh, we have to think of this as an opportunity to create a new generation of jobs, a new economy in our country. Green collar jobs, yes, but they're really the blue collar jobs uh, of the past, the blue collar power, building the windmills, the solar, the new technologies uh, that will uh, slowly but surely wean us away from this incredible mess that the Middle East is now and is very likely uh, to become even worse in the years ahead. We thank all of you for your testimony uh, here today. Uh, it, it's very helpful to us because it's going to help us to begin to chart a course where we help the American consumer uh, stop being tipped upside down at the gas pump and having money shaken out of their pockets every single time they refill. Thank you so, so much. Next on C-SPAN 2, a press conference with the President and the German Chancellor. That's followed by Prime